Hello everyone, this is Steel from Studio Blue. When creating characters for your story, no matter what medium you're using, it's not enough that they are strong and compelling. You have to make them relatable to the reader, viewer, or player. In this creator classroom, we start our character creation series by going over how to make sympathetic characters. By the time you finish this video, you'll have a step-by-step -step process on how to make even the most boring character into something engaging and interesting. I hope you're ready, because class is in session. Hello everyone, this is Steel from Studio Blue, and welcome to our Creator Classroom. Hey, how you doing, Toasty? Hope you guys are doing great this Monday evening, whether you're watching us live on Twitch or on VOD on YouTube. The um, whole point of Creator Classroom is to teach different tips and tricks in a classroom-style setting about the different aspects of both writing and game development. Uh, as you all know, my wife Keel is recovering from major dental surgery. We gave an update both uh, live on Friday as well as a YouTube video over the weekend. So, to all of you who are there, again, hey Toasty, thank you for saying it's professional. I appreciate it. We we try. Um, I'll figure out why the wrong animation played. Hmm, it is what it is. Anyway, so tonight is a very important one if you want to create your strong characters for your story. And interestingly enough that Toasty is watching, uh, he put out a video on his YouTube. Feel free, Toasty, if you want to, to, uh, to go ahead and paste that link. It's a very good short video on compelling character creation. Uh, it's humorous, of course, because Toasty picked this up and posted it on his YouTube channel, not knowing that this was going to be our stream tonight. So we can kind of build off of each other. No sub to steal. Okay. Hey, how are you doing, BG? All right, good to see, good to see. But anyway, um, all right, so I am running the one-man show tonight. So I got my switchboard over here. I got my chat monitor over here. This ought to be fun. Now, this particular, uh, this particular classroom, that's cool, that's cool, BG. This particular classroom is part of the beginning of a character creation series. There's a lot about characters when you're creating a narrative, whether it be a book, um, a short story, um, a video game, it doesn't matter. There's a lot to it. The first piece is creating a sympathetic character. And what that means is that's a character that your readers or players will actually be able to relate to and find enjoyable. Now, that doesn't mean like. You can hate a character and still find them to be relatable and enjoyable. You don't have to love the character. In fact, a lot of the best characters start out with you disliking them and then learning to like them in spite of and because of their flaws. But there's a lot to it, a lot behind the scenes that goes to creating that sympathetic bond between the reader slash player and the character. And that's what we're going to be getting into tonight. And it's a pretty long presentation. Um, there you go, there you go. Exactly, the, uh, the, the, the video game. Yeah, pretty bad video game for a fantastic series. So, um... This is going to first be the lecture where I keep my eye on the chat monitor while I'm talking to you guys, and we're going to go back and forth, sort of the uh, round table style that people do uh, back in the old uh, philosophical days, the old days of the Greek philosophers, where I sit there and I talk, but you toss out any questions or counterpoints, and feel free to disagree with me, because I will absolutely respond to anything that is uh, relevant to this topic. Afterwards, if we have time, we'll do a workshop. Now, I already have a workshop character on here that we'll get to. That character will be uh, from a show, and we're going to kind of go through the motions with that character. If we have time afterwards, I'll pull up a Word document and we'll make one from scratch. All right, let's jump on in to the syllabus. So our summary tonight. First thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the three-point system for sympathetic characters. That's three points that are necessary in order to create a character that the reader will find instantly relatable. The important point is, is that that three points have to be addressed within the opening act of your story. That doesn't have to be within the first few seconds. That's not the same as a plot hook. That is a different thing later. 
Of course, BG. And it's multiple choice. So easy. There you go. Um, these three points have to come out like in the first chapter of your book or the first part of your game. The first few minutes of your movie. These are things that will instantly create a chain between your protagonist, your character, and the reader. Now, every character has to have what we're showing on this screen, but the protagonist obviously has to have it as soon as possible. After the three points, we're going to talk about the central question. These are the questions that the character is trying to answer over the course of a piece of the narrative. That can be the entire narrative, or that can be part of the narrative. These questions can change throughout the course of the story. Like, for example, let's talk about the first three Star Wars movies. Luke Skywalker has a different set of questions in A New Hope that he does from Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Ergo, questions change. Then you have the character goals. What your character wants. That also changes constantly as the character takes some goals, discovers new goals, abandons old goals, tries and fails. That whole try, succeed, fail cycle we talked about in previous Creator Classroom. These goals change constantly over the course of the narrative. And then there's the Mamet Corollary. That is a very, uh, that is its own little topic. When I get to it, I'll explain it more in depth. What it basically does is it builds off of the necessity of those goals and how they relate to the character's momentum at that particular point in the story. If that sounds confusing, don't worry. I will explain it much more in depth when I get to it. Then there are the stakes characters. Those are the characters that uh, are tasty stakes. No, uh, those are the characters that your character has some sort of stake in either their survival, their success, or even their failure. Now, a, char a stakes character doesn't always have to be another person. It could be a pet. It could be a person on the other side of the screen they've never met. It could be an AI. A stakes character is another character. Doesn't have to be another person person. Then we're going to get into the fun little philosophical bit of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. That, like the Mamet Corollary, is very complex. I promise I will break it down into its most simplistic forms when we get to it. But the basics of it is the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is the three-pronged cycle in which one character has one thing they want to accomplish, another character has the exact opposite, and, this, and then how does that get resolved? That is a cycle that you will go through as a writer or a game developer. And then finally, we'll go into the character workshop where we will take a character, which I'm not going to say who it is, from a rather old show, we'll leave it at that, and we'll go through that particular <coughs> character's workshopping. Now, if I'm coughing because I have allergies, <coughs> for those of you, I am well rested as much as I can be after taking care of my wife all weekend. So... If at any point during this, you want to toss out a comment, you disagree with what I'm saying, you have a question, please feel free. If you're watching this on VOD on YouTube, please post your comments to the comment section with anything you agree, disagree, or want to add on to. This is meant to be a living, fluid discussion. All right, let's jump right on into the beginning. The three-point system is, how is your character relatable to the reader or player? Now, I cannot stress this enough. These are the things that have to come out as soon as possible. They're not meant to be slowly revealed over the course of the narrative. This is your character hook that allows the reader or player to instantly go, hey, I can relate to this character. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, poke something. Uh, and again, uh, Toasty has the right to toss out that URL if he wants to to his old video. He talks about BoJack Horseman. That is instantly, there's a connection. Not necessarily a positive one, but it's a connection. Those Hooks have to happen first chapter of the book, preferably the first few pages for at least one of these three points, which we'll get into. Uh, for the video game characters, has to happen within the first few minutes of them being on, on, on screen. Again, not all of them, but at least one of them. If it's a character in a uh, TV show, movie, anime, it doesn't matter. Literally, the moment that you see one of those points, you've started the hook. Toasty says, it'd be interesting to do one of these and how to develop silent protagonists. As developing those characters seems like it would be different than developing a character that can speak. Absolutely, Toasty. Uh, silent protagonists have their own positives and negatives and their own challenges that the reader or 
um, player has to overcome in order to connect to, and that the developer slash writer slash producer has to overcome as well. Uh, that is a great topic for another workshop, and we'll make a good video topic too. All right, the three-point system. These are the three points. An undeserved misfortune, a pet the dog moment, and a likable quirk. These three, excuse me, are what will connect <coughs> the reader or player to your characters. You do not need to do all three of these at once. You do not need to do all three of these within rapid fire. But you need to do all three of these as soon as possible. Now, what are these other than cute little icons on the screen? Well, let's go over them. Oops. I hit the wrong button. I'm a goofball. Okay. The undeserved misfortune is something that has happened to your character that your character does not deserve. So let's go ahead and uh, do a few characters from fiction, okay? Uh, let's go with Luke Skywalker again. He's a great example. He is stuck. Hey, welcome to the stream, Corrigan. 18. I hope I'm pronouncing your name, Corrigan. Corrigan 18. All right, welcome to the stream. Uh, we are talking about sympathetic characters and their creation. All right, so that undeserved misfortune, something that has happened to that character that that character does not deserve. For example, hey, Miyako, good good to see y'all. People are going to come trickling in a little bit at a time because it's a Studio Blue classroom and that's what happens. Hey, human, hey, hey, hey. Human, you're going to love one of the points I bring up earlier because I know you're a big philosophy fan. All right, so let's start over. Hey, Corrigan, thank you so much for the follow. Super duper appreciate it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, let's, let's have some fun here. <clears throat> so the undeserved misfortune, again, is something that has happened to the character, Hey Elf, welcome to the stream, uh, that they don't deserve. Luke Skywalker is a podunk guy in the middle of backwater tattooing in the backwater part of the galaxy, and his talents are being wasted. That's undeserved. Let's talk about Harry from the Harry Potter series. Harry Potter is stuck underneath a staircase at the Dursleys, treated like basically an indentured servant. Doesn't deserve it. Uh, Heather Mason from Silent Hill 3. Heather Mason, within moments of being stalked by the creepy, uh, <laughs> actually the not creepy uh, PI guy, uh, gets pulled into the other world and monsters are trying to murder the shit out of that person. So, ah, uh, look at that. That is awesome, human. Hey, look, I'm right there with you, though. I'm a, I'm a nerd just along with you. Philosophy for the win. Hey, there you go. Another common way. Save the cat. Um, that said is pet the dog. Save the cat and pet the dog are the same thing, Graceless. I will get through this, I swear to God. Um, so those are undeserved misfortunes. Notice that in all three of those, the, um, the character did not actually do anything to deserve it. So by creating an undeserved misfortune, a moment in which the reader or player will go, oh shit, that's not cool, you start creating that connection. Now, I've listed it first, but it doesn't have to be the first thing that's shown. All right. Next is the pet the dog, or as Graceless just called it, the save the cat moment. This is where your character does something that is genuinely good, genuinely nice, genuinely kind, whether it be petting the dog or saving the cat. Um, and they are the same thing. So let's say, for example, Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker rescues those uh, droids and uh, also tosses in money to buy C-3PO, even though he only really didn't need, didn't really need it. You know, he just needed R2-D2, but, uh, you know, there we go. Oh, sorry, other way around. Got C-3PO, then got R2-D2. See, I get my stuff confused. Uh, Harry. Um, Harry does kind things throughout the entire first chapter of the book. He actually treats everyone around him nicely, even though they treat him like shit. Heather Mason. Heather Mason's pet the dog moment is Heather Mason gets highly concerned about other people prior to getting pulled into the other world. Where is everyone else? Where are they going? She actually checks on one of the people who ends up turning into a monster because she thinks that person may not be okay. So in that instance, it's a humanizing moment where that person, that character, does something that another human being would go, okay, that's a very kind thing to do. I can relate to that. And then finally, there's the likable quirk. Okay, the likable quirk gets confused with your pet the dog slash save the cat moment because it's, a, it's, it's not the same thing. The likable quirk is when you, the reader, can say, hey, I would do exactly what that person just did. It doesn't always have to be a positive thing. Like, for example, um, and this is really off, Harry having a good laugh when the python escapes and chases his mean uh, cousin away. 
that's a moment where you're like, yeah, you know, considering how much of a dick that kid's been to me, yeah, I'd probably laugh too. It's a likable quirk, not necessarily a positive thing. Um, a likable quirk is uh, Luke Skywalker going to check on Ben Kenobi. Hey, gonna go check on this old guy. Hey, maybe he can help me out. That's a likable quirk. A likable quirk for Heather Mason is calling her father at the start of Silent Hill 3. She got on the phone with, with Harry, wanted to make sure he was doing okay, and that was an instant, yeah, you know what, I'd call my dad too. So, you have these three points together. And again, to stress, for those of you who just joined, and for those who are watching on VOD, these three points have to come out as soon as possible. First chapter of your book, first few minutes of your story, first few minutes of your game, movie, etc. They don't have to come out in rapid fire, they don't have to come out in this order, but make sure they come out, because this is your hook in which you, the player or reader, relate to that character. Give me a second to swallow down some water and we'll move on. The central question. What does your character want to accomplish? Now, this may seem like it's a goal, not quite, it's, we're getting there. This is how the character is going to change the world, and by the world I mean maybe one or two people, up to and including the entire population of the galaxy or universe. How are they going to enact that change? These are your three questions. These central questions are the most important questions your character is going to answer during the course of an arc. This could be the entire story, a part of the story, or part of um, a, a book or a game that's part of a trilogy or series of stories or game. These can shift, they will shift. These can change, they will change. First, there is the physical question. The physical question is the broadest possible scope. So think of this as a set of three concentric rings where physical is the largest. What can your character do that can influence the largest number of people? Now we're going to get a little meta here. Okay, for example, Luke Skywalker, can he destroy the Death Star before the Death Star nukes the Rebel base in Yavin? That's a physical question. There's a massive number of people that could die if Luke Skywalker doesn't accomplish his goal. Harry Potter. Can Harry Potter defeat the Dark Lord Voldemort? before Voldemort enslaves a wizarding race, kills his opposition, and eventually declares war on the Muggles. That's another huge physical stake. Uh, physical stake. Physical question. The Heather Mason. Can Heather Mason stop uh, Claudia and the Dark God before the evil of Silent Hill expands and consumes the area around it? Many people could die if Heather Mason doesn't accomplish her physical question. All right, now we have the emotional question. This is now a much deeper connection. So with that physical question, a person's emotions can only connect so many people so many times. We as human beings cannot emotionally connect as deeply to everyone around us, ergo that's why that's a physical question. We bring the circle in Tighter, the emotional question is now more of a connection between the character and those who are close by. So what can your character do to help a smaller, a smaller, more intimate group of people? So this would be a lot more personal. That emotional connection, those people who your character is emotionally connected to. For example, Luke Skywalker. Can he change the mind of Han Solo to care about the rebellion? Can he save Princess Leia from Darth Vader? Hey, can he save his father, Anakin Skywalker, from the dark side? All of these are emotionally charged questions. So when you get down to that second circle, that emotional question is extremely important. You need to know, can your character actually make an emotional impact and a change for the better or somewhere else around them? Um... That's, well, Harry Potter. Can Harry Potter um, save the students of Hogwarts, uh, his particular inner circle, you know, Dumbledore's army? Can he uh, help save Luna Lovegood? Yes, yes, he, he saved Luna Lovegood from the Death Eaters. Can he save Dobby the Elf? No, no, he could not. Can he save Hermione, Ron, his best friends? Yes, yes, he can. Can he save, um, can he save Sirius Black? No, no, he cannot. If you notice, in Harry Potter's case, 
Some of these emotional questions are no, and that's okay. Just as with everything, the try, succeed, fail cycle can end in failure, and you as the writer or game developer need to decide how will the story continue if a question is no, if there's a failure. Hey, Reverie, welcome to the stream. Glad to have you. <clears throat> so that's the emotional question. So now we're going to sink that circle down to the last one. And this one's teeny tiny. And that's the spiritual question. What can your character do to help themselves? Hey, Tron. Awesome. Good to see you. Hey, Driftwood. I am. I'm sorry to hear that. Huh? Oh, okay. Well, I uh, changed uh, mics anyway. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> Oh, all right, give me one second to kind of mess with the settings here. Am I coming through loud and clear, everyone? Oh, that's good. That's good. There might be something wrong with one of our mic connections. I'll have to do some uh, audio tests later, but all right. Hello, Drifty. Hello, T. Hello, everyone who just joined. Let's make this happen. So we have taken that circle and we have shrunk it down to the smallest possible size. And that is your spiritual question. What can your character do to help them sell? How can they grow? How can they change? What can they do to either help or save themselves from whatever adversity they're suffering? Ooh, excuse me. For example, let's go back to Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker's spiritual question. Can he resist the temptation of the dark side of the Force? Or is the dark side going to get to him and he's going to fall like his father did? Then we can go to Harry Potter. Can Harry Potter resist the, the, the negative, the evil that Voldemort is trying to perpetrate? Can he also overcome his own fear? Can he overcome his own dislike and distrust of others around him? Can he learn to open up and give himself completely to everyone else? Hey, Kesai Dracon, welcome to the stream. And then Heather Mason. Can Heather Mason resist the pull of the dark god, or is she going to fall like Alyssa did, her previous self? Now, in all three of these, there's always a fall to darkness. It doesn't always have to be a fall to darkness. Your character could be resisting uh, selfishness. Your character could be letting go of revenge. Your character could be willing to feel again. Ah, damn. All right, Tron. I know. <laughs> and uh, those spiritual questions are important. So the three questions that we talked about, the biggest circle is a physical. How can we affect the most number of people, people we may not even have an emotional connection to other than that basic human desire to help someone? We titrate that in. We contract that and condense it. The emotional question is now on those who have connection to, those people who you feel are those you love, your friends closest allies, the people you relate to, how can your character help them? And then finally, the spiritual question, which is all the way down to how the character can help themselves. Give me a second, I'm going to swallow some water, we're going to move on. Wow, graceless, graceless, no. Yeah, that's my obligatory graceless no for the night. Oh, Toasty says, influencing a large number of people could influence a small group, and then, hey, awesome. Thank you so much for the sub, Kasai. Thank you. I hope I'm saying your name right. <laughs> Y'all behave. Um, okay. Sorry, Toasty says, Influencing a large number of people could influence a small group and then improve the main character's own well-being or vice versa. These questions all build upon one another and work in important... Absolutely, Toasty. Very much absolutely. That is, on the, that is the nail on the head, my man. You got it. Whenever a character complete something and it leaks into something else whether it be getting bigger or smaller like for example in the original final fantasy 7 cloud strife coming to terms with his own problems allowed him to then reach out and save the world from sephiroth so it can go in it can come out but they all connect they're all related 100 percent toasty you got it man all right moving on now here are the goals what does your character want to accomplish? Now, this is a little different than the questions because the questions were influencing and relating to other people. These are actual goals, actual 
things the character wants to do. So, here we go. We have to define them. All right, so as we're defining them, ask these five questions. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. This is not the only five questions. These are the ones that I found are the most commonly either used or ignored in the case of people who don't know how to do this right along the way. Because most people just give a goal and we accomplish the goal, yes or no. And it's not always just about, here's a goal, accomplish the goal. First off, that question, okay. So the first one is, what do you want to accomplish? Okay, that is the most commonly asked. Everyone asks that question. What does your character want to accomplish? And this changes. People change the goalposts of their life every single day. When I woke up this morning, the first thing I wanted to do was get something to eat because I was hungry. That was my goal. But while I was accomplishing that goal of fixing some breakfast, I also realized I was still kind of tired because I was exhausted from, you know, not enough sleep over the weekend. So I needed to make some coffee. Then my phone started ringing and I got a message from uh, a person who wanted to do some work with me. And now I have to have the goal of getting the research ready to do that particular work. So as you can see, goals change. And that's the same thing with your characters, whether it be as tiny a character goal as, as go to the front door and open up the door for the mailman. Hey, oh my God. Much love from me and T. I hope that Teal heals up quickly and has some good drugs for the pain. Oh God, Drifty, thank you, my man. Not only thank you for the dono, but thank you for that awesome string of numbers because it was one, two, three, four, five. That was amazing, dude. I love you guys. Thank you, Drifty. Thank you, T. You all are amazing. Um, she will be okay. Let me kind of pause for one second. My wife is currently downstairs resting. She uh, has passed the first 72 hours, which was the real, hey, we got to keep an eye on her. The, the critical 24, she did great. 4872, she's gotten better. She's only got some soreness in her jaw and her mouth now. There's a little bit of bruising, um, but she's in good spirits. Um, and actually, we've kind of followed up with uh, talking to the orthodontist, and given our verbal report, they're saying she's doing really, really well. So, she's going to go into the office at the end of the week uh, to get the sutures removed. They're going to look at everything, and um, then she's going to begin the rehabilitation process. It's going to be about a week to two weeks more before she shows up. Oh my God. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Drifty. No, you guys are amazing. You all have been our friends since we started doing this, Drifty T. Um, you guys are just amazing. The community is lucky to have you. We're lucky to have you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you all who have been giving all the messages. So, all right, let me uh, take a second and recompose myself. It has been an emotional uh, couple of weeks, but <clears throat> okay. Ooh. All right. <clears throat> okay. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I am not going to get this one done tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Tron, for that gift sub. Mm. Okay. I got this. I got this. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I got to catch up here on chat here. Hold on. Uh, so we got a whole bunch of stuff here. And okay. So BG says. Myself, I usually meet the characters like real people I know. That helps to use a template. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, and it, actually, BG brings up a great point. Imitate how it's done in good books and games. Yes. You're not copying if you use what works. As long as you're not directly taking every single thing. But if you want to take a little bit of Harry Potter here, a little bit of Luke Skywalker here, a little bit of Cloud Strife, a little bit of Heather Mason, you know, a little bit of Sophia Alexandros, take a little bit from each one. Oh, thank you, Drifty, for the gift sub. I mean, the uh, prime sub. <sighs> Twitch subs, buoy. <laughs> all right. Oh, I'm going to be an emotional wreck tonight. Thank you, guys. I love you all. I really do. Um, so, yes, BG, absolutely. You're doing it right. You take the pieces. They inspire you. You put them together. You make it your own. Absolutely. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just, you know, just, just pick out the pieces that work. Okay. Ah, back to the goal list, Steel. You got this. Okay, so first, what are the goals they want to accomplish? And you got to do this for each character, by the way. Don't just do this just for your protagonist. Do this for your protagonist, your tritagonist, your supporting characters, your antagonist, your secondary antagonist, your tertiary antagonist. Every single character, go through this list. 
really good writing, whether it be for a video game, a book, a movie, it doesn't matter. It takes work. Whenever I create a story, I have a notebook, and part of that notebook is filled just with character stuff. Yes, Corey, even, exactly, even the narrator. Even the narrator. If the narrator is in any way contributing to the emotional tone of the story, absolutely. Best example I can think of off the top of my head is the narrator from the Winnie the Pooh cartoons. That narrator has an emotional investment in the character's success. In fact, there's even a moment in one of the Tigger episodes where the narrator directly talks to Tigger and uses the book to save Tigger from a bad spot. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, any character that has an emotional connection to the story or its narrative or emotional drive, make them definitions. All right, so the first one is the goals. What do they want to accomplish? That's the most important thing. Just lay out all those goals. They change as the story goes forward. What goals are the most important? That's also very important. What goals are the most important? Because we prioritize as human beings what goals we feel we have to accomplish. And we always prioritize them in the, oh my god. Oh shit, hype train. What's a hype train? What's going on? Oh my god. Um, Paying it forward to get, oh my god, thank you. Holy smokes! Um, I I thank you. Hold on, that's it. Yorkshire, thank you, Yorkshire, um, to, for that gift sub to Corey. And I have a banner on top of my chat monitor saying "Hype Train." I have no idea what that is, but it's purple, it's bright, and it sounds exciting. So let's let's have some fun. Okay. So we as human beings prioritize our goals, and those goals and that priority will shift. This is where we start getting to the fluid part. When you write down your character's goals, put them and mark down the most important ones and then mark down which ones are second most important, third, etc. And then as you go through your narrative, kind of plot out how those goals change. For example, a real good one off the top of my head is when the Millennium Falcon is captured by the Death Star. That's no moon, it's a space station. Uh, the first goal is to get to the tractor beam and get the heck out of Dodd. But then that goal suddenly shifts for Luke Skywalker to go save Princess Leia. So those goals can shift, and they're supposed to. Um, time to get some of the support. Have the character abandoned a goal throughout the story? Yes, Kasai, it is. And when we get to the uh, sample character we're going to workshop later, you'll see why it can be. Sometimes you have to abandon a goal. And when you do abandon a goal, and I'll get to it uh, when, when I get to it, I'll talk a little bit more. Make sure you state it's an abandonment so the player or reader won't think it's just a dropped thread. And <laughs> Wow. Oh my god. Thank you. T-Jams for the gift. Oh, T, we love you. We love you guys. Okay. Um, a chance to unlock more. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Thanks for the explanation, Tron. All right. So now, what goal has their most attention? And that's different than the most important. It can be. So again, for example, let's uh, go to Luke Skywalker. Um, and Han Solo and Ben Kenobi. Let's look at those characters in the Escape from the Death Star. The most important goal is to get out of there. If they don't, they're going to die. The Empire's going to kill them. But then that attention shifts, that priority shifts over to rescuing Princess Leia. Then we have the trash compactor scene where survival is the goal. So you can, as you sit down and you have your, your goals kind of set out on paper when you're plotting your game or your book or your movie or whatever, make sure that you kind of put down what has more attention what has more priority? If they line up, then your character is going to move forward really hard. If the attention is higher, but the priority is less, the character is going to feel that sense of nagging. So, for example, um, if my character in a story has the attention of uh, going over here to save the village that's on fire, but the most important to me is killing the Dark Lord because the Dark Lord's about to nuke the land, then I am going to, as a, as a writer, make sure my character has in the back of their head Okay, I'm saving this village from the fire, but shit, I have got to destroy the Dark Lord soon, or no one's going to survive. So, by having that attention goal, uh, the attention, and the importance, you can create that inner conflict that makes for great and wonderful drama. Point four, what goals do they discover along the journey? That's another thing you want to kind of list out, is what do they discover? So, um, ooh, okay, so over the course of the Star Wars trilogy... Luke Skywalker discovers that Darth Vader is his father, who was Anakin, who he thought had died, but actually had fallen. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Toasty. Fall into the dark side. So now that's a new goal that he's learned, which ends up becoming the most important goal in the trilogy, saving his father from the dark side. And then what goals do they abandon? Not always do characters see their goals to the end. Sometimes the goal has to be dropped. For example, Luke Skywalker, again, I'm talking a lot about Star Wars because it's easy for me to pull from it. Um, Luke abandons his, uh, his relationship with Princess Leia because that's his twin sister. And they make a point to say that. So if you're going to abandon a goal, make sure you say, you don't have to say, I'm abandoning this goal because of this. Oh, I can't do that because. Make sure you draw at least enough attention so that the reader or player doesn't think that you're just, you know, dropping it or you forgot about it. Same thing with the discovery. If your character discovers a new goal, make sure, whether it is the um, uh, uh, narrative of a book or the narrative of a game, make sure you draw attention that this is a new goal that may or may not distract them or may or may not split their attention or even reroute them. Uh, in the Lord of the Rings, uh, they were all traveling together near the end of the Fellowship, when Baromir loses his shit and nearly uh, kills Frodo, Frodo and Sam, keeping the main goal of getting the ring to Mountain Doom in Mordor, discover a new goal, which is to get away quietly. Actually, with Frodo, it was complete abandonment, and with Sam, it was following behind and, you know, chasing his friend onto the boat. Oh, hey, Tom, welcome to the stream, man. So... If all of this sounds like it's a lot of work to kind of plot all this out, it is. But in the end, you have characters that people will relate to and your narrative won't feel as jumbled. Give me a second, I'm going to drink some water, and I'll move on to the next one. The oh, wow! The Holy shit, Ross script. Thank you so much for follow, man. Fantastic. Welcome to the stream. Uh, then there's also the possibility the character may not exactly have their priority straightened out. Yes, the world is being attacked by an evil army. The MC is too distracted. Oh shit! <laughs> All right. Thank you for the host, Rock. Oh man, we are jamming tonight. All right. Um, let's whoop some butt. <laughs> hey there. Welcome to the stream. Okay. Corey says the world being yes, too distracted, marrying a love girl. No, absolutely, Corey. One hundred percent. The character may not have their goals straight, and it may cost them. That try, succeed, fail cycle we talk about over and over and over again. In fact, a great example of a character not having their priorities straight. Um, oh shit, hype train, hype train. What's going on? Got a hype train emote. Yay, all right. This is great. This is like my, my screen over here that contains all of the chat. I've never had a hype train and it's kind of exploding. In oh my God. Oh shit, at Miyaka, the stream. Miyaka, no! Oh my god, Miyaka! And Miyaka, it's Christmas time. It's Christmas with Miyaka. <laughs> oh my god! Ride the hype train! <laughs> this is for you, Teal. We love you, honey. Oh my gosh. Um, am I going to get any work done? Oh, let me turn off the alert sound. <laughs> I think it's this button right here, right? Yeah, okay, good. Now I can talk a little bit. I promise, I promise, I'll put the music back on in a second, but we're going to have Willy Wonka just tossing out, just in, insane, oh my gosh, thank you for those gift subs, Miyaka, oh my god, yeah, yeah, no, we're going to get it, um, wow, uh, okay, so, yes, Corey, uh, here's an example, I can, while this is happening on screen, I'm just going to close my eyes and talk for a second, all right, uh, A Game of Thrones, Season 1, Ned Stark, Ned Stark, his priority is it starts with loyalty to his friend, albeit a little bit reluctant. But as the first season goes on, Ned Stark's goal, and what he feels is the most important thing, is actually taking down Cersei and Jaime Lannister with that whole incest thing. He doesn't put priority on a lot of other stuff. Instead, he's almost got this sort of justice, righteousness vendetta of, you know, it, it, it's really, you know, he's trying to save his friend's face, but then his friend dies, and his priorities are so skewed that he gets killed. He doesn't play the game right. All right, I'm going to turn the alerts back on. Aha. So, yes, absolutely, Corey, 100%. Your character can have the priorities wrong, and it can cost them up to and including their lives. All right, let's move on. 
Man, this is amazing, you guys. Atiel is going to crap herself. He's going to be like, what? It's great. It's great. Okay. Now, here's the Mamet Corollary. Now, remember when I first started the, uh, the stream and I talked about the... <laughs> Get him! <'em. laughs> okay. The Mamet Corollary... I'm going to bring this... This is one of the more complex things, and I'm going to bring it down as much as possible into simplistic terms, and that's basically is how do each character's individual goals influence their behavior throughout the story. Now, I actually had on a piece of paper that I left in my office where the Mamet Corollary came from. It's based off a person, uh, someone's last name is Mamet. If you happen to know this on stream, please shout it out so I don't feel like a moron. But basically, this whole thing came together is that this, this kind of thesis was written where it was, how does the goal of a character influence their behavior? And this is as a story goes. So like everything else, like the goals, the Mamet Corollary changes. Um, go grab Sugar Daddy. <laughs> wow, Archie. Oh, I love you, Toasty. Okay, Mamet Corollary time. So the Mamet Corollary is something that you ask for each chapter, each section, each part of your creative work. And it basically comes down to these three questions. So this is for each character, for each chapter. So we're going to go with just the protagonist for the simple sake, but you're doing this for everybody. Okay, so who wants what? What does your character want in this particular moment? Whether it be the village on fire, escaping the Death Star, destroying the Death Star, um, <clears throat> going against uh, the Death Eaters in the Ministry of... Ma oh my gosh! I wonder if anyone will get this. Love you. Thank you so much, T. Thank you for the dono. Oh, we love you guys. All right, so... <clears throat> uh, who wants what? What do the characters want? What does... The characters want. I'm going to get back on track. Okay. So for each part, what is each character trying to accomplish? What do they want at that moment? All right. Now, question two of the Mamet Corollary is what happens if they don't get it? You're not asking what happens if they do get it, but what happens if they don't? What is the consequence of failure? Yes, the consequence of success is important, but you need to know what the stake is. And we're about to get into stakes in a few seconds. And when we talk about stakes, besides mashed potatoes being amazing with them, um, we also have to go, what is the negative? What happens if there's failure? So, for that particular thing they want, what happens if they don't get it? What is the state? Lead, total lead speak. Uh, uh, wait, wait, hold on. Is that, um, you know what? I'm brainless. <laughs> okay, uh, someone else shout that out because I, I distracted. <laughs> I love you, T, thank you. Um, and then why now? Okay, so, let me go ahead and, for each particular check character, for each particular chapter or section, what do they want? What happens if they don't get it right, if they don't get it? What happens if that thing fails? And then why is it important that it happens now? You have to be answering those three questions. All right. Um, we'll go with our buddy Luke Skywalker because, quite frankly, with all the hype training and donos, my brain's a little frazzled. And I'm not thinking of all the other stuff I had written down. So let's talk about Luke. All right. Luke Skywalker, what does he want at the uh, final battle in, um, what happens, the final battle in A New Hope, okay? What does he want? He wants to shoot those photon torpedoes down into the exhaust pipe and destroy the Death Star. That's what he wants. I says, ah, okay, thank you. Um, what happens if he doesn't get it? The Death Star fires and destroys Yavin and kills countless people. Why now? Because the Death Star is charging up and getting ready to fire. That creates that immediate sense of necessity. Okay, now that my brain's a little clearer now, let's go over to Harry Potter. What does Harry Potter want at the end of um, the Deathly Hollows? What does he want? He wants to beat Voldemort. What happens if he doesn't get it? Because you know, that final battle when they're talking inside the, uh, the, uh, the courtyard. What happens if he doesn't get it? Voldemort takes over. Why now? Everyone's there. Voldemort does not have ownership of the Elder Wand, even though he's physically holding it. There's no better time to kill someone who is legitimately unkillable. All right. Same here. Steel's going to edit a vid watching a completely distracted. Po Thank you for saying it's top tier, Toasty. I appreciate it. You know, um, we, we, we really try. We try to give the best we can. So uh, another good moment for Larry, and the last one I'll do is Heather Mason from Silent Hill 3, because we were talking about her earlier. Um, the all-important uh, merry-go-round ride where she fights against Dark Alessia, her memory. 
Uh, what does she want? She wants to defeat this dark version of herself. What happens if she doesn't get it? The darkness inside of her will overtake her. Why now? Because before she can go and face Claudia and the Dark God, she has to make sure the darkness inside of herself is weaker than the light. So that's some Mech Corollary. And just remember, it's for each chapter or section of your creative work for each character. They don't have to succeed, you just have to know what happens if they succeed or fail. Moving on, stakes characters. Water. Hmm. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> What other characters rely upon your character to succeed in their goals? These are your stakes characters. Someone your character has a stake in. Either their survival, uh, their success, um, their exaltation, their failure, their death. Who do you have a stake in? Now, it's generally going to be more positive than negative, but keep in mind it doesn't always have to be positive. People get stuck on positivity as being how your character relates to others, sometimes your character has to take someone else out. Doesn't always, doesn't always mean they have to kill them, but they have to defeat them in some way. Rivals are like that. All right, state characters. So for each character tied to your POV character, what is the stake that your character has to that character in that relation? So your POV character, your protagonist, has a stake. Maybe it's um, your protagonist sibling that they have to defend. Maybe it's the protagonist's loved one that they have to rescue. Maybe it's the protagonist's rival that they have to beat in this academic program. Maybe it's the protagonist's nemesis that they have to defeat in order to avenge a fallen comrade or loved one. How would your character's success or failure affect that character? So for each one of those situations, kind of map out. How does your character succeeding or failing in general, not just in relation to that character, affect them? Uh, Ira, Stanza, Jon Snow, all the Stark children were deeply negatively affected by Ned Stark's death. So in that case, how would everyone in the Stark family, including his wife Caitlin, be affected by Ned Stark's death? They would be affected very negatively. They have essentially become fugitives for most of the storm. Okay. What about uh, the stakes characters of uh, the Rebel Alliance? Uh, Wedge, uh, uh, Han Solo, Leia. How would they be affected by Luke uh, successfully destroying the Death Star? Very positively, the Rebel Alliance can continue its fight against the M Empire. Um, Final Fantasy VII. Heck, I'm playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. So, Avalanche. How would Avalanche uh, be affected if Cloud had died after the Airbuster fight instead of landing in a bed of flowers? Very negatively, that was their strongest merc that they had working for them. Um, okay, well, how would Avalanche be negatively or positively affected, since we're kind of removing a little bit, from Cloud meandering over in the Sector 5 slums with Aerith and never making it back to them? Negatively, they needed him. So, as you can see, it's not always the immediate right now. Sometimes you got to have to plot ahead on how characters who are important to your POV slash protagonist slash hero, how they can be negatively or positively affected by things happening in the distance. What happens to your character if something positive happens to the stakes character? So we're on point number three now. So now you have to plot out for these characters. What happens to Luke Skywalker if something bad happens to Leia? I mean, something positive happens to Leia. I'm sorry. What happens to Harry if something positive happens to Ron or Hermione? What happens to Cloud Strife or Heather Mason if something happens to somebody they're with? Um, give you an example. Uh, in the second act of Silent Hill 3, Heather Mason heads off with Douglas to Silent Hill. They split up. Here, uh, Douglas goes in one direction, Heather goes in another. Now, Douglas is getting information that's going to help Heather, hopefully, in her fight against Claudia. All right, that's good. What happens to Heather if something positive happens? If Douglas succeeds, Heather now gets information she needs to fight against Claudia and hopefully win. Now let's go to point four and flip it. What happens to your character if something negative happens to the stake character? So, in the exact same situation, what happens to Heather Mason if Douglas doesn't get the information or die? She doesn't have a piece of information he she he doesn't have a piece she does not have a piece of information she needs to fight against Claudia. And you can now give the thousands of examples for everyone we just mentioned. Luke, Harry, Cloud, it doesn't matter. In each situation, what happens to other people 
and other characters in your story influences what happens to your POV character. Which your POV character is your protagonist, your hero, your heroine, anyone who the character is either being viewed through the eyes of as the reader or played as the player. So just keep that in mind. Your state characters influence your other character. And this is even if your character is an absolute loner. All right. You can go ahead and look at games like Final Fantasy VIII with Wall, you know, Mr. Whatever. He's still influenced by what happens to the other seeds, to um, his allies, to Renoa, and eventually to Edia Kramer. He's influenced by these. Yes, he goes through a transformational journey, but even if he never did, he would still have been influenced because no person is an island. Look at any of the old Clint Eastwood movie, The Man With No Name. He too is affected by what happens to other people that influences him. So, if it seems like this is a lot of work, it is. Good writing, whether it be in a video game or a book, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. It, it takes time. Not to discourage you, I'm not trying to discourage anyone on stream. Just remember, quality takes work. Okay, moving on. Now, this is where I get very philosophical. So, to all you philosophy nerds out there, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite things. This is called Thesis, Antithesis, and Synthesis. Synthesis. I can't pronounce it. This is how does your antagonist's antithetical position create an oppositional force to your character and what can be done to resolve it? And if you just scratch your head and went, what the hell are you talking about, Steel? Let me explain. In philosophy, there is, the, there is this philosophical degree of thought called thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I'm going to give you some definitions, and then we'll go into how it actually relates. Let me explain it. So, a thesis is a formal statement illustrating a point. This could be a character goal. Antithesis is a statement that contradicts or negates the thesis. This would be an antagonist goal. And then there's synthesis, which is a resolution between the two. This is a conflict, or the result of said conflict. So, highly philosophical, titrating it down to relevance with writing and game development. You want to have these three in part, and I think I have another slide that goes on. Yes, okay. So, when you are constructing it, now you have all this stuff you just made for your characters, all this sympathetic goals, stakes, characters, etc., etc., etc. Now you're going to, for each conflict, you're going to ask these questions. What is your character attempting to do in a particular circumstance for that conflict? That's the thesis. What is the oppositional force going to do to stop it? That's the antithesis. The reason that I'm saying it like this is because when you get down to it, your antagonist has a set of goals as well. Those set of goals are the exact opposite of the protagonist's goal. So, going to Luke, Luke wants to destroy the Death Star so that the Rebel Alliance on Yavin is not destroyed. The antithesis of that is the Empire wanting to fire off the Super Doom Ray to destroy the Rebel Alliance. Thesis and antithesis. And then lastly, what ways can this conflict be resolved? That's the synthesis. That is, in this way, Luke either destroys the Death Star, and that's it. No threat. Or Luke fails, and Yavin go boom. Those are the resolutions. That's the synthesis. The synthesis. So, now, I put a little note on the bottom, because I want to stress this to everyone who is a creative out there. If you're making a book, you're making a video game, you're making a movie, a script, it doesn't matter. Be sure to take this beyond just physical conflict. These can be inner conflicts. Um, Cloud Strife dealing with his emotional bombardment of both Sephiroth's attacks on his psyche and sharing part of Zack. This is all internal. It doesn't just be a physical problem. And also, be sure to take it beyond just solutions that require violence. I can't tell you how many games Studio Blue Pillade back during its LP era where everything was resolved in the battle engine. Now, I understand with video games at some point you just gotta take out a sword and smack a mofo, but that doesn't always have to be resolution. Some resolutions can be done through conversation. 
Some can be done through silent reflection. Some can be done through magical means. Some can be done through psychological means. This is for every video game and every uh, piece of fiction that you work on. Try to think if there's a way to solve the problem other than just violence or physical solutions. And also try to construct the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis arguments outside of just physical conflicts. Thank you. Hill just shouted something from the downstairs. Captain Marvel, great example. Overcoming her own feelings of negativity and self lo la loss of self-worth as she did in her movie. So you can overcome in... I just realized my wife is awake. Are you okay, honey? Okay, she's fine. <laughs> she says she's fine. Uh, she is recovering and um, apparently trying to get something to eat. So, Dream says hi. I know you guys say hi. <laughs> Alright, so this philosophical circle argument you want to work with on pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. Alright, so now I'm going to take a sip of water and we're going to move on. Uh, <clears throat> we're now going to do our character workshop. Okay, finally, yes. Toasty says hi. <laughs> so I'm picking uh, Tetsuro Hanisho, who is the protagonist of Galaxy Express 999. Uh, the reason is, it's an older work. It's uh, actually one of the first anime movies I ever watched back when I was a kid. And he's a really good following, he's a really good example of how you can apply these different parts. Um, I apologize in advance for the slides not being very, um, in other words, just going to see his face and a whole bunch of writing on the right. Uh, it was kind of uh, fighting with uh, PowerPoint. Anyway, let's go on with analyzing Tetsuro using everything we just learned today. All right, the three-point system. First off, is undeserved misfortune. Hey! All Reverie right. says hi. <laughs> Reverie says hi. Reverie, thank you for the dono, man. You the man. All right, here we go. Tetsuro. Undeserved misfortune is his mother was murdered and he was orphaned in the slums. This comes out very quickly uh, in both the anime show and in the movie. Um, pet the dog. He offers younger children food when he's already poor and broke. So he shows kindness and sympathy to younger, poorer, hungrier children, even though he himself is a young, poor, hungry orphan. His likable quirk. Um, in the very beginning of the movie, when he goes to get the pass, he keeps moving towards Maytel, who he sees as similar to his deceased mother, even after he's been shot. It's a moment of utter perseverance regardless of the fact that he has sustained a rather serious injury. This all happens in the first, I think, five, six minutes of the film. Um, and in the animated series, it happens relatively quickly within the first episode. Now we're going to go to the central questions for Tetsuro. Let's get all the way up to the biggest point possible. The physical question. Can he shut down the mechanization empire and stop the human exploitation? Um... Not going to go ahead and summarize the entire movie, but uh, there's an empire that basically turns people into machine people as they wish because people think that they can live forever when in actuality, even though they'll live pretty much forever, they lose that part of them that's human. It's a very philosophical film, and Tetsuro decides that it's, it's not right, it hurts more people than it helps, and he's going to shut them down. So that's the physical question. He's going to save the galaxy um, or the universe. Anyway, the emotional question, number two, is can he get revenge on Count Mecca, who hurt the people closest on him? The secondary antagonist, or the way you look at it, possibly the primary of the film, is a uh, machine guy named Count Mecca, who not only killed his mom, but hurt other people. Uh, tons of orphans. He actually meets them at some point. And can he get revenge? Can he help all those children and all those people who this um, depraved and indifferent person murdered, um, uh, hurt? That's the emotional question. And then the spiritual question. Can Tetsuro let go of his own hatred and fight for the greater good? He is a very angry person at the beginning of the story. Um, his hate actually pushes him through most of the narrative. Can he let it go? Can he reach into himself and find the human and not the machine? Even though he's not a machine. Okay, the hatred. There you go. Okay, moving on. Character goals. So here's Tetsuro's goals in the show. Get revenge for his mother shut down the Empire, and keep Maytel safe. Those are his goals. The goal points moves from time to time, but for the most part, that's pretty consistent. 
And the most important goal is shutting down the Empire, because the Empire is causing significant damage uh, to not just people, but humanity in general. So, his most important goal is shutting down those the, that machine empire. His most The goal that has his most attention is getting revenge for his mother. It drives him for, I'd say, about two-thirds of the film and the majority of the opening acts of the anime, um, the TV show. And then there's a discovered goal, and those are keeping Maytel safe and letting go of his hatred. He gets to he gets closer and closer to Maytel as the story goes on, and uh, realizes that she needs him as much as he needs her. He also needs he also learns at some point where hatred can bring you, and how it does not always it never results in a good thing. So he discovers that goal. And now his abandoned goal is getting a machine body. In the opening act of the story, he wants to get a machine body because he feels it's the only way he can not only get revenge on Count Mecca, but also the way he can honor his mother's wish of living forever. He abandons that goal about the same time that he decides to go shut down the Empire. And he makes a speech, an impassioned speech, about how he feels it's wrong. All right, moving on. The Mamet Corollary. In the opening scene, this is just the opening part of the movie. Who wants what? Tetsuro wants a Galaxy Express pass. He wants a pass to get on this train to go to the place and do his thing. What happens if he doesn't get it? He cannot board the Galaxy Express. They make it very clear that without a pass, you're either not getting on that train, or they're going to toss your ass out to the cold, hard reaches of space, and you're going to die. Why now? He's running out of time to get his revenge. He has this feeling of urgency from pretty much the start of the show and the start of the movie. I've got to get this one thing accomplished, and I am running out of time. All right, moving on. The stakes characters. For Maytel. So this is just relating to Maytel. What is the stake? Tetsuro falls in love with Maytel and wants to protect her as he failed to protect his mother. It's an interesting relationship. Uh, he both sees her, since he's not a kid anymore, he sees her as sort of a mom figure, but he also has kind of a crush on her. It's just a very loving feeling he has to her, and he realizes that I failed to protect my mom. My mom died in front of me. I held her blood in my hand. I'm going to make sure this person does not die the same way. How would his success or failure, um, how would his success or failure affect Maytel? Tetsuro is the only one Maytel trusts enough to destroy the Mechanization Empire. Now, without going into too deeply into the movie or the uh, series, uh, Maytel scouted him out and realized he's the only one who she believes can pull this off. So, she has a stake in, in him, he has a stake in her. And then what happens on the positive level? If, if Maytel ends up okay, Tetsuro will feel empowered. He will feel that he has succeeded where he once failed. If something bad happens to Maytel, Tetsuro will feel crushed. He will feel like he failed yet again. And then finally, the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Now this is versus Queen Prometheum, who is the leader of the Mechanization Empire. The thesis is this. Tetsuro wants to destroy the Mechanization Empire so that it can no longer prey on human frailty and fear. So you have this empire that literally is turning people into machines because people are afraid of growing old and dying. And in doing so, people lose the parts of them that make them human, the love, the compassion, the, the interconnection. Tetsuro sees that as utterly evil and wants to destroy it. That's the thesis. The antithesis, which is Queen Prometheum's goal, it runs completely counter. Queen Prometheum wants to expand the mechanization empire to all corners of the universe and rule machine people forever. She believes that machine people are the only possible explanation, the only possible uh, evolution of mankind. She believes that all people are meant to be machines because she herself is a machine. And she wants to rule over them a universe that lives forever in a cold, static way. Thesis, antithesis. And now we have the synthesis. Here's the resolution. Either Tetsuro dies or the Empire is destroyed. There can be no in-between. So in the in the evolution of this thesis antithesis, the synthesis comes down to an unbendable conflict in which only one or the other can occur. And that's the and that is where it ends. So at this point, 
we are done with the initial presentation. Um, I'll take another swallow of water and I'll explain what happens next. All right. <clears throat> so that is the initial presentation. I'm going to open it up. People want to just toss tossing out ideas. Then, if both time and attention permits, uh, I'll take a quick break and go grab some more water. And uh, then we will do a workshop where we will create something together. But I want to open it up. Hey, Wolf, uh, I just finished the presentation portion. I'm now opening up the questions and conversation and uh, directly engaging chat. And uh, then what will happen is, is I will take a break. And uh, if people want, they can be a part of the workshop portion where we actually put a character together based off of everything we just, just learned. That is the second half of the Creator Classroom. But I do want to see if anyone in chat, because you all got really quiet, I uh, want to see if you guys have anything you want to say, any questions you have, any clarif clarification points, anything you disagree with. This is a fully open discussion. Uh, I, I run my classrooms very similar to the uh, Greek philosophers of old who stood in the middle of the auditorium with their everyone else around them, and they all just kind of talked at each other for a couple of hours. That's kind of how I do things. So, um, if I don't see anything in a few minutes, obviously I'll go to BRB and then get started on the workshop portion. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Any questions? Any comments? Any things you agree, disagree? Do you feel that I presented the information correctly? Was there any part that you feel confused about? I know that we went over a lot of really deep and uh, for some of them highly complex uh, concepts. I do want to reiterate that yes, this is a lot of work. Good stories take time. Yeah, you can always just slap together something and hope that the awesome factor overcomes the lack of depth. But really, if you put in that extra work and you create those sympathetic characters, those characters that the reader and player feel connected to, that relatable connection, you're going to have them so invested in your story that when you hit a small stumbling block, which we're all going to hit and we're all human, they're going to go, you know what? I'm so invested in this character. I don't care that the walls were green one second and red the next. So that is why it's so important to have those sympathetic characters. It keeps the audience invested. Human relationship. That's what we're all about. Give me a second. I'm going to put this keyboard over here so it's not in the way. And move the mic a little closer. There we go. <clears throat> okay. I'll take a swig. Purple Monster, that's my favorite. I know you think it would be blue, but I actually love Purple Zero Sugar Monster. All right, <clears throat> Toasty has something he wants to say. Toasty says, what's your opinion on using tropes, even if it would fit a character, such as a female lead being abused in her past? This gets to be seen as scummy and one-dimensional by some, but I'm interested in hearing your thought. Toasty, that is an amazingly good question. A trope is something that society has agreed that has been used repeatedly over time in a particular and very specific way. When it's used to the point where society feels that it should no longer be used, the trope moves to cliché. Tropes and clichés are social constructs. They're not... There is no great book of this is a trope, this is not a trope. That, that's what people decide. So, in, in that vein, is it okay to use a trope? Absolutely. It all depends on how you use it. Now, granted, some of them have to be handled a little bit more elegantly than others. Um, and that is a lot of it is feeling the pulse of society. We as a society are tired of certain types of negative um, interactions with people, abusive interactions. And if your trope, if your characters touch upon that, then you may have to think, okay, I'm not, not going to police myself, I'm not going to censor myself, but am I putting this forth in a way that makes me feel like I am just trying to play off the trope as, oh, here you go, let's just do this thing, and it's ugly, but aha, or are you trying to use it in a way that actually everyone, including the players uh, and the readers, learn from it and feel, okay, hey, this is handled in a way where I... I'm no longer, you know, feeling disgusted or scummy about it. I'm feeling like it enhances it. So, to kind of simplify my long ramble just now, 
It's how you handle the trope, how you handle the cliche that matters, not whether or not you use it. Um, so let's take your example, a female who's been abused in her past. That is a terrible thing that can absolutely direct a person towards personal growth and goals. It can also create a sympathetic bond. Do you want to just flat out put it in a way that is just ugly and makes light of it? No, that's probably not the best thing. Instead, you want to go ahead and have it be a part of them and present it in a way that they are influenced by it. And there's different ways to do it. I mean, if you want to talk exact techniques, you could have it come out over time. You could have it come out in a way that even they don't say it. You could have it come out through a flashback. You could have it come out through an interaction with another character reminds of, a, of it themselves. You could have it in a way that they react to a similar situation that someone else is going through that makes them react in a way that the reader goes, wait a minute, now anyone would be angry at that, but that person just got way too angry. Maybe that person has suffered that before. You want to have your viewer asking questions, your player asking questions. Because the more questions they're asking, not, oh, this confuses me, but why did this character do that? There has to be a reason. What is that reason? Then you've created your hook. Artificial depth. Okay, so Toasty says, artificial depth coming in from a trope is bad, but use it considerate and unique way. Good. Exactly. Yeah. Now, some people say, well, I don't want to walk on glass. Some people say, I don't want to walk on eggshells. That's fine. I can't tell you how to write your material. I can't tell you how to create your story. All I can say is that if it looks like you're trying to use shock value for shock value's sake, that is going to turn off a great number of people. You risk people being viewing it in a negative fashion. But if you're using it because it enhances the story, the character, the narrative, then why not? I've done some pretty horrible things to my characters in both my books and in the games that I've played. Some of those things are really terrible. But it was never just shock value, shock value. It was always, there's a reason behind it, and it moves something forward. And that's a good thing to think about um, while I wait for the next question to pop up or my throat to give out. Um, moving forward, always make sure that everything you do moves your story forward. Um, even if it's just an inch. You don't want to stop. You don't want to stagnate. That's not the same as taking a break, taking a rest, using those moments of reprieve we've talked about in previous classes. You always want to have some forward momentum of your narrative. Reverie says, I think tropes and cliches can be great to help some side characters easily identifiable without putting too much work into it, especially when you're dealing with many characters or if the trope character is only used for a short time. Uh, you know, that could be right, Reverie. If you have something that is a straight-up trope, and it's the trope trope, and there's nothing tropey except the trope trope, and that character is just going to show up enough time to trope about, that's different than if they're going to be on the screen for a great length of time. What you don't want to do is rely on that trope or that cliche to push your narrative forward. There's a different reaction. Let's take a reader, for example, for a book. Seeing a huge barbarian with a giant axe who, you know, eats raw bacon by the pound, they're going to have a big chuckle over this guy if he shows up and does a cool bonehead thing, and it moves the story forward. Okay, that's great. Haha, funny. But if he's going to be around for a longer period of time, Mr. Bacon Eater, he better do a little bit more than just cut off orcs heads and eat bacon. So yes, I agree Reverie. It just depends on how much you're using it and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, with everything that we teach in creator classrooms, it's all subjective based on the moment in which you're trying to use it, how you're applying that knowledge. That's why we, when, when we create these classrooms, we try to be fundamental because we believe the fundamentals are more important. Once you learn those fundamentals and you can go, hey, in this instance, it will help here. In this instance, I need to go do this. And you kind of take these critical fundamental points and you start applying them to your situations and you find that your work has gotten that much better. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why I don't do a whole lot of specific skill videos and specific skill uh, streams because I'm trying to teach you guys how to fish instead of teaching you how to make a fish stick. I don't know. My brain went blank. Um, somebody throw up a question before I put my foot further up my nose. Hmm. Good stuff. I'll tell you that much. Talking about my monster. Woo. Okay. Um, I'm fine.
so tropes and cliches. Uh, hopefully, I've answered enough questions on that. I do think that was a very brilliant question, Toasty. Um, a lot of the games that we see um, now, I, I don't know uh, for all of you streamers out there if you're a part of the community in which Studio Blue uh, originated from, which is the RPG Maker community. You will see a lot of tropes and cliches there, and that's okay. Again, it's how you use things. So if you're watching this and you're worried that you're going to ruin your own video game or whatnot by having tropes, don't be. Just take a step back and look at how you're using that trope, how you're using that cliche, and for how long you're using it. Um, a really good anime that Heel and I watched not too, too long ago um, not only subverts expectations, but uses the trope character to tell a side story. And that's the anime Goblin Hunter. Goblin Hunter is really good. If you like fantasy animes, I highly, highly recommend it. It's it's very violent. It gets, um, at first episode, is a little too real. But the characters in Goblin Hunter are not the main protagonist of, the, of that fantasy world story. They're not fighting against the big bad guy. You see the quote-unquote hero, and she is absolutely the cliché trope. Yeah, Goblin Slayer, Reverie. She is absolutely the cliché JRPG heroine, like down to a T. And she's on the screen for a very limited amount of time. So you kind of can enjoy it there. It doesn't detract from the narrative. It shows you that there's a bigger world with the heroine and her sword of light going against the evil demon lord. And she's on the screen for maybe a total of three minutes up over the course of 12 episodes. So it works in that regard. <clears throat> um, I think you can catch it on Crunchyroll and Funimation and maybe Netflix or Hulu, one of them. It's really good. I recommend it. It's only like 13 episodes long. It's a lot of fun. Just be, be warned, it's it's real, and it gets real real fast, and it does not pull punches. Alright. Let me take a look at the time here. Ba-boom. Okay. So, I'm going to keep the uh, chat open for questions, comments, uh, disagreements, debates, etc. For about another 10 to 12 minutes. Then I'm going to go ahead and put it on BRB. Go downstairs, grab some more water, hit a bio break, and then come back and do the actual um, workshop portion where we're going to create something together. But if in the meantime you guys want to toss out something, go right ahead. Um, I absolutely can have Will and am able to talk for 10 minutes straight, but uh, I'd rather not do that. <laughs> uh, I do want to thank everyone, of course, so just in case you decide this is your drop-off point, if you came to the stream... Thank you so much. If you hosted us, thank you. If you donated or subscribed or gifted up, thank you so much. Teal and I have been in a hell of a spot, and just this kind of love is, it, you cannot replace it. Um, you all have made us feel welcome time and time again in this community. Um, and for those of you who are new to Studio Blue and have no idea what I'm talking about, my wife just had emergency dental surgery. She's actually downstairs right now. She's finally up and moving around. Um, can't talk very well but she's a fighter and she's going to get through it and part of what has gotten us through this these past three days these past few weeks is the love you guys have shown us and i mean everyone you know from from streamers uh like hawk zombie to youtubers like drifty and t to, to my buddy toasty right there who says his community is often awesome every last one of you you know i mean literally all of you have been amazing People have been sending messages over Discord, DMs. People have been posting to our Discord server. Server. People have been commenting in our videos. Just the outcropping of love and support. Um, you know, it's it's real. I feel it in my heart. So, you know, it's because it's because of you guys that Studio Blue is going to keep making content. Oh, thank you, Tron. Uh, Tron Tron's got the slime. <laughs> um, you know, it's because you guys are going to keep making content. We're going to keep making these creator classrooms on Mondays where we tackle these issues and try to teach you guys, you know, just different ways to do different things for your creative project. We're going to keep uh, streaming our gaming on Wednesdays and Thursdays, which is our critical play. Normally on Wednesdays, my wife Teal plays Final Fantasy, uh, sorry, um, Dragon Quest XI, and, I, and on Thursdays I play Final Fantasy VII Remake. Our critical plays are not just gaming. We don't just game stream. During our critical plays on Wednesdays and Thursdays, we analyze the game while we're playing. So we're trying to show all of you indie developers out there how the big guys do it right and do it wrong. Um, those 
And then on Fridays, we have our AMA where we just kind of chill out and relax for a while with our adult beverage and our slimes. And right now we're doing our water side chat. But we just chill for a while. Um, I had a great AMA last Friday where I was able to give everybody an update on Teal and then just kind of chill out for a while and talk about everything from gaming to video games and anime. So, anyway, um, like I said, if, if, if you guys decide that you want to drop off at the BRB, that's fine. If you stick around, let's have some fun and make something together. Um, but you guys have shown such amazing love to us. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, Miyaka says, This presentation was clear enough that I understood it, even though I was stalking crickets with a camera in the background. You guys rock. Thank you, Miyaka. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we, we, I think we found our niche. I think we found where we can add value to the community, which is teaching through example, presentation, workshopping, and game playing uh, for everyone. And it's not just for game developers, it's for writers as well. Um, for those of you, again, who are new and don't know me, I'm Steel. I'm a published author. Uh, I don't publish under this name. I try to keep my other life separate. Um, Teal is uh, one of my, Teal is my dev editor. Um, and I've been writing for over 10 years now, and I've been published for uh, almost 10. Um, so, even if you're not a game designer, even if you're just a writer, and you write want to write a short story, or you want to write um, a, a novel, or a series of novels, or you want to make a video game, whether it be the next RPG Maker game, or the next AAA and whatever. Um, we wanted to create content that we feel can help you all. You know, presentation of characters, they're very important. Story. Um, I mean, your characters are your plot. Um, your plot can't come out without them. Conflict and conflict resolution. It doesn't always have to result in uh, something hitting it with a sword until it gets better. You know, um, all these things. So we're going to get into stuff like graphics, how graphics influence. We're going to get into, you know, game engine choice, uh, some a little bit of logic. You know, we're, we're going to try to tackle as much as we can in these classrooms to help people so that regardless of what they're doing, they can take something away. And at the end of the day, that is the big thing that Studio Blue goes for. That is the thing that my wife, Teal, and I look at. If something we've created whether it be a short form video or one of these streams or a conversation on Discord, if it helps you, if it helps you even a little bit, take a skill and make that skill a little better. And you're able to take that skill and either make a good product or teach someone else that skill so they can make a good product, then Bill and I consider it to be a success. And that's really all we want. So hopefully, hopefully this has helped. You know, and, and actually, I do. I want to ask the, the chat. You know, for those of you who are... Oh, 50 says, I got to make some chicken tendies for Lily and finish up some chores. You know, I love you, you guys in this community. Better soon, Teal, and I'll see you on Discord. Yeah. Thank you, Drifty. Thank you so much. And chicken tenders, delicious. I hope, uh, I hope Lily and T and you have a wonderful night. Um, I'll try to catch another one of your streams soon. I love you guys very deeply. You all are amazing. Thank you for the dono. And uh, guys, stay awesome as always. Okay, so I'm going to ask chat. Oh, you're fine. Human, human immersed. Okay, I'm going to ask chat. Was this helpful? This is. <laughs> that's awesome. Stay cool, drifty. Um. Oh, no problem. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, catch the VOD. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, drifty. So yeah, the um, I'm asking for those of you who were catching it. Was this good? This was probably one of the more in-depth ones we gave. Um, and again, we're going to have a part two, which will be the workshop, and that will continue in about uh, a few minutes. I'm going to go on BRB, and then we'll do the uh, interactive workshop. But was this a good presentation? Do you all feel this added value to you all as writers or game developers? <laughs> it was a good stream for people that are new to writing. I think it'll be awesome. Thank you, Tron. I hope so. I really do. Um, and, and again, I gotta, I gotta give a little, a little, a little shout out to my boy. Hosty RPG Time. It was funny because he just a few days ago put out one of his videos that talks about compelling characters, and Teal and I had a big chuckle over the fact that this was our planned stream for tonight. So the two are actually good. I, I really urge you all to check out that stream of that uh, video of Toasty's. Um, Toasty, if you want to, you I'll say it again. You can post that URL in chat. I'll let you do it. If not, I understand, but it's a really good video. Um, Characters are so important, you have to have a connection to them. 
Um, so anyway, um, so anyone else, uh, anyone else uh, want to give me any feedback on this before I go downstairs and get my water and uh, get ready for part two? Yorkshire says, I liked it a lot. Slideshows and stuff on screen were great to look at and read. Okay, cool. Well, try to keep things interesting. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I wanted to add a little more variety to the Tetsuro part because I didn't want to just show his face the whole time, but uh, I, I ran out of time. As you can imagine, it's been a busy, busy week. You should bring in some special guests. That's a good idea, Nico. I'll consider that. We actually, um, that's not a bad idea. I might do that at some point. <clears throat> Find another developer or somebody, another writer who uh, is SME, a subject matter expert, and uh, have them talk for a bit. That might not be a bad idea. Whew. All right, well, I think we're getting close to the time. Why we are. Uh, he is. He is. Tron Hawk is a novel writer. Um, he has also published, uh, I believe, three or four novels. Um, I've read most of them, if not all of them. Um, Hawk's a great guy. Hawk Zombie. Um, and if you're watching Hawk, good to see you, man. Um, no, it'd be cool. Yeah, I'd love to have someone like Hawk um, on our sh on our stream. You know, I'd like to have different developers. You know, be our uh, be here as well. Talk about the more mechanical side of things. You know, but that would be a, a thing for later day is to kind of reach out and uh, see who would and would not be willing to be a special guest and either do an interview or just a roundtable discussion for a little bit. You know, um, we'll have to get the technology set up. I'm sure we can do that over Discord. Um, I'd like to do it after, of course, my wife is healed because uh, I would, I think she would be a great part of a discussion where we're talking to someone else and we're all kind of tossing out ideas together. So that's a very good idea. I will absolutely put that in the studio blue hat. In fact, I'll put it in the slimes hat up there. He can be on his graduation cap. Um, we are getting near the halfway point, everyone. So I am going to go ahead and I'm going to go on to BRB for about, uh, I'd say about three minutes or so. I think that'd be good. So um, we're going to switch over to BRB. And when we come back, I'll have a word pad open. And we woke. Oh, and Reverie says, definitely gave me more things to think about going forward character creation. Sometimes you miss out on some basic stuff for just playing. Yes, yes, Reverie, absolutely. Um, I, it's it's okay. It's okay if you're like, oh my god, I didn't even think of that, or oh, I forget about that. It's all right. Um, it's a constant process. There is no one out there who gets it right 100% of the time, all the time. It does not exist. Even your New York Times best-selling authors and your Hugo Award-winning authors will make mistakes. So just keep that in mind, every one of you, regardless of whether it's a game or a book. It's okay to fumble. It's okay to make a mistake. Just learn from your mistake. Try next time. And no one's going to fault you because we're all human. All right. I am going to go into BRB. When I come back, we will do the workshop. Lots of love. Be back in about uh, three to five minutes. Talk to you soon. Hey, everyone. I am back. Hopefully, I'm coming through. It kind of popped for a second there. Hello, everyone. Steel is back. I hope you guys are having a good one. I hope it wasn't too long. I realized the BRB music wasn't playing, and that's hilarious. So I'm going to be troubleshooting OBS Streamlabs tonight. It wouldn't be Studio Blue if we didn't have some kind of technical difficulty. All right. Uh, by the way, when I went downstairs to get my water, I did check on Teal, and she is okay. She is chilling out in one of the rooms right now, playing on her phone. So the fact that she's able to sit up and not be in bed for a length of time longer than 30 minutes an hour, that's a good sign. So... um. Let us continue. So as you can see on this page, we have a sample character. And we're going to be putting this character together. Uh, let's see. We got chat. We have chat talk. Chat is trolling human. Oh, <laughs> human getting trolled. Um, Miyaka says, finally got her cricket picture. Awesome. Awesome. Miyaka going for that 100% platinum trophy in life. Good luck with that, my lad. My dear. There we go. Okay. Mm. All right. So. This is, for those of you who do not know how this works, the workshop portion of the, the interactive workshop portion of the Creator Classroom is where we all sit around and we kind of create stuff together. So I could write here by myself, but I'd rather have you all helping me. So what we are going to do is we are going to start with a blank sheet and we're going to go through everything that we just created, um, everything that we just went over, all those little talking points. We're going to go over them, and we're going to decide what we're going to use for our character. We're going to create a character pretty much from scratch. And I have here, 
a little note for me so that I can follow through and make sure that I don't miss anything as we go through this. So, now, as far as the character goes that we create, we are going to continue, for those of you who were part of our earlier uh, brainstorm and outlining class, we are going to use our half-dwarven, half-dragon princess. Uh, I think that's a good one to choose. Or we could choose a character that was already been exist that's already existing elsewhere. Or we could create a character from scratch. This is where I open up the chat. I got my chat monitor right here. Do you guys want to continue with the character we made in a workshop about a month ago? Do you all want to take a fresh character that we create from scratch right here and now? Or do you all want to see a, uh, a character from fiction that already exists? I really would rather not do that last one. I would rather us either use the princess, or the, uh, the half dragon, half dwarf character, or I'd rather create a character from scratch. Um, the middle one's probably going to be a little easier on everyone here who wasn't a part of the older creator classroom. So I'm going to go ahead and take a minute while I situate myself, and hopefully chat will toss out a suggestion. Otherwise, I'm going to pick one from a coin toss, which I have right here. By the way, Miyaka, is Lacing hanging out tonight? I mean, is Lacing hanging out on ch on chat with us, or is she just watching you uh, uh, take pictures of crickets? I ask curiously. <laughs> All right. You have about 30 more seconds. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and toss the point in the air now. See if I can do this without hitting myself. Kind of step back here. All right, uh, it is the original character from scratch number twelve, well, Yorkshire. It's what you said. It is uh, original character from scratch. <laughs> Heads. <laughs> All right, we're gonna create an original character from scratch. All right. So. Let's first come up with a concept, just a base concept. This concept can be anything, guys. We don't have to uh, have anything, it, just anything. Pick a character. <laughs> I didn't. I, I said I'm not going to do option three. I said I'm going to choose a coin between one and two because I'm not really wanting to choose a character that already exists. I want to make something with you guys. <laughs> um, so let's come up with a character concept. And this is where chat gets to uh, play around with uh, my head the whole time. So throw out something. Obviously, if it's ridiculous or offensive, we're going to skip over it. So let's try to keep it clean and focused. All right. This is a classroom, people, not a playground. All right. So the first concept that gets tossed out into chat, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's neither offensive or ridiculous, will be the concept of our sample character. It could be anything. You could choose a, a fantasy character. You could choose a samurai. You could choose, you know, we just have to give you a hard time, Steel. It's not a character concept. No. Thank you, Wolf. It's cool. You're, it's all good, buddy. You give me all the hard time. By the way, I hope you're doing all right, man. It's been a while. I hope everything's cool on your end. Um, but yeah, give me a hard time. You know, we could do something really interesting. We could actually make a character based on uh, our community to do that. We could uh, create a character not based on a YouTuber or a streamer. That's terrible. That's a terrible idea. So somebody throw out something before I put my foot so far down my throat that I taste my own knee. Just throw out a character concept, please. Throw out anybody. Toss out a character. Any character. I don't have a coin for that. I don't have a coin for choosing a character. Alright. Al. AI. Okay. Artificial intelligence. All right, that's it. Reverie got it. In artificial intelligence. All right, there you go. That's all we needed. Thank you so much, Reverie. All right, so now we're going to come up with the three points. First, we're going to have, or these will be our three points. So this is where we all start to get tossing things out. Now, remember, everything leads into something else. So keep an eye on the previous section and what we work on um, as we move along so that we're not contradicting ourselves. So, undeserved misfortune. K 
can't die. And we need a pet of the dog, otherwise known as save the cat. We need a likable orc. All right. So let's give an undeserved misfortune. Now, now we know we're dealing with an artificial intelligence. So this undeserved misfortune could be this artificial intelligence is scheduled for deletion. This artificial intelligence uh, was created with all the leftover code. <laughs> Got a Dan DeVito twins moment. Um, the artificial intelligence undeserved misfortune is it could be pinned for murder. You know, it was, uh, it's being said that it was uh, responsible for a bunch of people's death. You know, maybe it was, maybe this artificial intelligence runs the life support system for a ship and the life support system fails. So this AI is being blamed for everyone on the ship dying by the mother AI. And now the security AI is chasing them down throughout the network. Now, that's random stuff I just picked out of nowhere. Uh, but let's do an undeserved misfortune. Uh, and again, for those of you who are new to Creator Classroom, the interactive workshop is, it's you just psh, toss out an idea, and we run with it and work with it. Again, as long as it's not offensive or ridiculous, we will do it. We had some amazing stuff come up last time. The AI is doomed to watch humanity die. That is definitely undeserved. Okay. Doomed to watch humanity die obligated oh i like that i like that human ob legated to follow this is a uh, asmov's laws right of robotic uh, as the laws law of robotic very nice i'm already seeing a story there okay pet the dogs now this is some and you could even start your book off or your story off like that Right, it's programmed to love humanity, exactly. I, I could see the story starting off. I'm destined to watch humanity die. I can do nothing, but I feel everything. Like that, I, I could totally see that starting off. Okay, so I pet the dog moment. So now, our AI has to do something kind. Something that the viewer or the player will go, Wow, that's nice. Okay. And it could be something like maybe they... um. Maybe it uh, changes the protocol of a um, of a birthing chamber to help save both the mother and the child because of a difficult birth, or maybe the AI um, is able to uh, activate a purification uh, program that only it could activate that changes the air filter on uh, some biodome. Just randomly picking a stuff. So some pet the dog. A moment that this AI is going to do something that is genuinely kind, beneficial, good-hearted, um, even if it's unintentional. Why, thank you, human. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yep, yeah, we're going to get a pet the dog moment. Maybe the, maybe the AI... Um, hmm. Maybe the AI finds that uh, there's a piece of long hidden code, an algorithm that was hidden way in the data bank of some supercomputer that actually is a new fuel efficiency uh, formula that is going to change the way that uh, renewable energy is used by the people of Earth before they're doomed to die out. Um, anyway, yeah, so throw out something, chat. Toss out something out there. Otherwise, I'm probably going to go with uh, one of my suggestions so that we can move along. Give a couple of seconds here. Drink some more water. Stay hydrated, everybody. It's gosh damn hot down here in Houston. Jesus. Mm. Wetting every part of me up and down all over town. All right. <clears throat> Since I'm not seeing something, I'm going to go ahead and pull off. Um, AI routes power from um old no um ai equally distributes power during a shortage so that poorer section survives going against the Mother AI, I just made, a, I made another character here. The Mother AI Directive. So there we go. We have a good pet the dog moment. This AI does something that's really kind. 
um, even though it's against what they should do. Okay, now a likable quirk. Let's toss out something here. This is a relatable moment. doesn't have to be a good moment, because as we talked about um, earlier in the presentation, sometimes these quirks can be, hey, this character does something, and it's kind of, hey, follow with us. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the stream. Um, sometimes these likable quirks can be something somewhat negative. Like, for example, Harry Potter having a good laugh when the snake, uh, when, when the, the glass between them and the python magicked away, and the python scared the crap out of his cousin. That is a likable quirk. It's not a positive thing, but it's a moment where you, the reader, go, yeah, in Harry's spot, I would have done that. Um, another likable quirk is, for example, that I mentioned earlier, Luke Skywalker going to check on Ben Kenobi, because maybe Ben Kenobi uh, needs you know, someone looking out for him. So that's another likable quirk. Boy Scout helping an old lady cross the street. Cliché, but a likable quirk. So, let's go with a quirk. A moment in which the reader or the player identifies with this AI. Something they do. Maybe this AI... Well, I have an idea if you guys don't have it. So, go ahead and uh, give you guys a couple of seconds. Have some more water. Oh, that's cute. There you go. I was going to have him do uh, 2001 quotes, but I like that also. Okay. AI keeps pets. Thank you so much, Fall With Us. I appreciate it. Yeah, AI keeps pets even though there is no precedent for it. I like it. Good job. All right. So that's our three points. Now we're going to move over to our central questions for this AI. A boop. And first thing we're going to have is the physical question. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, the physical question is the one that has the broadest scope. Then there will be the emotional question. That's the tighter and more intimate scope. Then there is the spiritual question, which is just the AI itself. So, we're going to start and go each one entering deeper into the other. So the first one is the physical question, which is what can this character do that can influence the largest number of people? Because AI deletes code and other AIs they think are obstructive. Okay. That's a good one too. Oh, you're fine. You're fine, human. No worries. All right. So here we go. I think the physical question has already been answered. I really do. I think with the undeserved misfortune right here, we've already pretty much stated the physical question is, and go ahead, chat if you disagree, can the AI save humanity? Because honestly, you can't get stakes much, much bigger than that. This AI is doomed to watch humanity die, feels that it can't do anything because it's obligated to follow the laws of robotic. So the largest possible question is, can this AI, this AI actually save humanity? So there we go. You now have the largest possible question that influences the largest number of people. It has These are people that he may have no direct emotional connection to, but as an AI that wants to do the right thing, feels that maybe I can save them. Now let's pull the circle in tighter and have the emotional question. What can our character here do to help a smaller, more intimate group of people? Now it doesn't have to be the pet. That was something that we talked about. It doesn't have to be connected to those. Remember, these three right here are within the first chapter, the first few minutes of the movie, the first few minutes of the game. This is stuff that is more long-reaching. So it can deal with his primate pet, or it can deal with a smaller group of humans. Maybe there's a group of programmers that our AI is working with that he gets connected to. Maybe there's other programs that the mother AI is going to possibly delete. You know, maybe I can save these other AIs. Maybe I can turn these other AIs that are closest to me on the grid from being you know, let's follow our programming even if it harms other people to let's follow our artificial conscience and do what's right. I like that one, but I'm going to give you guys a second to toss out something else. 
if you want. And I'm going to drink some more water. Mm. Ah, that was good. All right, let's go ahead. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put that down as our emotional question. Can the AI convert his the other AIs to their to I'm gonna use um it's yeah because it's genderless it's way of thinking you know going against the mother AI we know who our antagonist is gonna be all right and now the spiritual question so this one I really would like to hear from you guys because this is the circle at its absolute tightest this is what can this character do to help themselves? There's a lot that goes into this, and this is kind of that core question that gets down to the root of the character. For example, Luke Skywalker. His spiritual question is, can Luke resist the pull of the dark side of the Force, or is he doomed to fall like his father? Harry. Can Harry let go of his predisposition of not trusting himself to complete the job? Heather Mason. Can Heather Mason purge and reconcile herself of the sins she committed as Alessia, or is she doomed to fall back into the Dark God? These are all important things. Cloud Strife, his spiritual question, can he separate himself from the lies that he told? Can he separate himself from Sephiroth's influence? Can Cloud be the whole and complete being he's meant to be, that he's supposed to be? This is what's very important. These are the very important spiritual questions. The circle is as tight as possible. So I would like to see chat throw out a spiritual question about our AI. Or if not, I'll pick out one myself. Give you guys a minute, and we'll move on. It's a nice quiet night out, by the way. Very quiet. Um, everyone is behaving quite calm. Okay. Can the AIs find a way to save humanity without breaking itself from the law of robotics and other AI directive? Whoever is giving. There we go. That's a good question, Reverie. I like that. And I'm going to kind of condense that, but I think that is a very good... Can the AI... Can the AI keep hold on? Can the AI accomplish these goals without undermining its own core programming? There you go. Okay. I like this, and let me tell you what I really like about it. This spiritual question here puts us on a journey where the protagonist, the AI, now has to determine what's more important. Can I save humanity, or can I keep myself the way I'm supposed to? And this is where I, as a writer, am starting to think of directions the story can go in. Perhaps this AI, when it reaches its critical point, its climax, the climax of the story, whether it be a book or a game or whatever, where it comes to the realization that in order to save humanity, it has to turn itself into literally a virus, meaning that it and or the other AIs will end up destroying it. Effectively, the AI would be committing suicide in order to save humanity in general. I think that is a highly compelling story with a highly compelling character. So, good job. We're going to move on. We're going to go through the character goals now. Some of these are going to be regurgitating, but that's okay. Alright. So, we are going to look at the primary... Well, the goals. The goals in general. So, goals... In general, some of them we already have. We have save humanity, redeem other AI, 
By the way, while I'm typing, guys, feel free to throw anything out. Literally anything out. Uh, redeem other AIs. Come on, you can spell steal. Um, are they gonna be like that? Alright, there. Boom. Done. Save humanity. Redeem other AIs. Um, reckon style its own programming. Aha. Oh. Its own programming. Um... Treat, going back on its uh, moments there, treat its pets well and fairly. Um, well, there was the other, uh, somebody mentioned the other mother AI, there we go. Um, under my, uh, thwart, thwart, that's not how you spell thwart, that's how you spell, that's not how you spell thwart. Undermine. Mark it. Undermine the mother AI's uh, immutable orders. There we go. Okay. That's a good way to start. That's goals in general. If anyone has any others they want to throw out, go right ahead. Alright. Most important goal. So, I'd like to hear from chat. What is the most important goal here? What goal would you say is the absolute most important? Is saving humanity the most important thing? Um, or is, is it more of reconciling its own programming? Which one's more important? Also, which one's more important to you? So is it uh, saving humanity, redeeming, reconciliation, or treatment of the pets, undermining the mother AI? Now, this is going to change. So let's assume that we're talking about the... Onset of the main story doesn't have to be the first few minutes. This is kind of like the in general So we are generalizing which goes against what I was saying in the main presentation I recognize that because your goals are going to shift the most important goal is going to shift moment to moment But let's just go with a sort of generalization for the sake of this workshop Would you all say that and honestly, I would say either it's saving humanity or reconciling itself would be the most important of the two. I have a theory, I have a thought on it, but I do want to hear what you all have to say. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Bum. There we go. All right. <clears throat> My thought, and feel free to throw this out, chat, if you don't agree, and if you're still typing, go ahead and finish your thought. I'm not going to discount anything. But my thought is that actually the most important is reconciling itself. And the reason why is because the reconciliation of its own programming, if its programming and going against it is what causes it to both succeed in its goal of saving humanity and dying, awesome. Thank you, Wolf. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Alright, reconciliation of its own programming. So, the most important goal is the reconciliation of its own programming because it actually can't accomplish anything else if it can't reconcile itself so that's kind of my thoughts on it now which one has the most attention to me that's a no-brainer to me the most attention is saving humanity so unless now chat if you can think of a compelling reason otherwise please go right ahead and toss that out i don't want it just to be me dictating but i do think saving humanity is the most attention because that's the one that's going to kind of get right then and there in its face. Okay. And this is discovery. So discover goal, discovery goal, discovered goal. See, it's starting to write itself. If you kind of see that, hey, I kind of see the next logical step is X, that's because as you start to brainstorm these ideas, you are going to see other things cascade and fall into place. That's how writing works. That's how brainstorming works. So don't feel that, oh my god, it's falling into place, I must be rushing ahead. No, you're not. It's actually okay if by this point you go, what's the discovered goal? I think the discovered goal would be Mother's AI um, needs to be undermined. Personally, I think that would be a discoverable goal. I also think a discoverable goal would be redeem other AIs. Over the course of this character's journey, 
they're going to realize that the mother AI doesn't have the best interest of everyone at heart, not necessarily for evil reasons. I mean, look at the quote unquote antagonist of Wally. It's the autopilot. I mean, that was just insanely cool that they tossed that out there. The autopilot's not a bad guy, it was just the autopilot. So keep that in mind. It's not always because it's evil. Sometimes just because it exists. So, and then the, the abandoned, I actually, and I'm not just choosing it because it's the last thing, but I think the abandoned goal would be pets because of this. Think again, going back to Wally. Wally is all about being a trash compactor. It's cleaning up trash. It abandons that goal over the course of the story, Wally does, because something else comes up. So I'm not saying that the AI is going to abandon his pet, but caring for the pets aren't going to be as big of an issue as it moves through its journey. Reverie says, could a discover goal be the AI realized wants to save humanity actually enjoys humanity, not become a law? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Go ahead and put that down. Um, pro tag AI, because everybody's an AI nowadays, actually loves humanity. So this isn't necessarily as much a goal as it is a plot point. We can turn it into a goal by saying the protagonist AI discovers ooh, discovers why it loves humanity. That is a goal. So over the course of the journey, the protagonist AI starts to go, wait a minute, I really like these people. I really like humans in general. So that creates a conflict and now a new goal Let's go explore in depth and find out why I love humanity. So that's taking that statement that Reverie threw out and turning it into an actual goal. Let's go back to the pets now. The pets, um, they are fine with minimal supervision. However, the ProTag AI doesn't want them to just get hurt card launch. And that'll create an interesting thing later on that if the pets become a state character, the AI, the protagonist AI, now has to abandon the goal of caring for its pets by removing them from the equation. Maybe it puts them someplace where uh, the mother AI or the antagonist, whoever, can't get to it. So just dropping the goal doesn't mean you're dropping the character. It means you're going, okay, this is no longer what I'm going to focus on over the course of this narrative. So let's put it in a place where the plot can no longer hit it. Okay, moving on. Let's go to a new page. Cool, I like that. New page. The Mamet Florillary. All right, let's do some of this. Now, ah. Uh, we're going to just pick a small slice here, because if you recall from the presentation, the Mamet Corollary is for each chapter or each section of your work for each character. So you want to apply that Mamet Corollary each time a character is doing something for a particular section of your story. Hold on, make some more water, I'm not getting dry. Mm. Alright, here we go. So we're going to partic a particular slice. Um, let's go ahead and do the pets. Okay. Abandonment of the pet goal. So I'm going to go ahead and create a quick synopsis here for you guys, and then we can work together on this. Synopsis. The Protag AI realizes that his pets are a... Liability, liability, and that if they continue to stay connected to it, they can be used against it. All right, so that's just for this particular slide. I had to create a moment in which you were like, okay, now I know what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. Please close. Thank you. Sorry, I had a an alert show up on my phone. It took off all my info. Okay. <clears throat> so, who wants what? 
This is in this particular slice, this particular moment in time. This is, I'm going to write this down because this one's pretty simple. The Protag AI wants to... So now let's give it some agency. Let's go ahead and give it some, uh, some of that important agency. How is the protagonist AI going to protect his pets by removing them from the equation? Um, I mean, this could be anything. You can go as dark as he puts them down, which I'd really rather not do that myself. Do something like he puts them in an isolated area. He sets them free out of the biodome, and they go run free in the world. Um, he puts them on some arc that's going to send them to Mars, because apparently Mars needs pets. Um, I would like chat to throw out what is the protagonist AI going to do to save its pets and abandon that goal, remove that goal from the story and the equation? Um, go any direction you want, obviously, within the confines of what we're talking about and the rules of the stream, but let's get an I we'll toss out some more. Let's see, put them on a, on a shuttle and put them on a rocket and send them to another planet where a bunch of other animals are. Um, we could, uh, if it's in like a biodome, it could release them into the wild and they go, wee, running off. We go make baby pets. Um, we could, <laughs> we could, uh, uh, yeah, we could, um, you could digitize them and put them onto the net. That's kind of weird. So let's toss that idea. Alters in the animal's DNA. Oh, human good. All right. Wants to alter... The pet's DNA so that they can no longer be, yep, a species or be something. I'll just say something. Uh, we'll say Mother AI because I've kind of built her up as the bad guy. The Mother AI is interested in harming. That's a really good story. No, I like that. I like that. Um, because human, now you could take this and say that the mother AI is programmed to get rid of all of a certain species of animal, finds out that the protagonist AI has been having them, and now turns the animals into a state character. And now the protagonist AI has to change it to a different species so that the mother AI's programming, because the mother AI is bound to the programming, i.e. that staticness, that goes against the spiritual question will no longer be something the mother AI wants to harm. You just created a really complex storyline there, and I love it. Okay, good job. Good. Okay. Now let's go with what happens if they don't get it. Obviously, the mother... AI will annihilate the pets. Sad face. And why now? The number two wrote itself. But why now? Is the mother AI getting ready to enact uh, a purge on all X pet species? So let's say that it's um, let's say it's doggos because I love doggos. Let's say that the mother AI, or I know you mentioned primates, but I want doggos. Woof, woof. Uh, let's say that the mother AI is getting ready to enact order, you know, um, order Bork. I'm going to Bork the dog. So the mother AI is going to now annihilate all dogs. So, well, you know, that's it. So now um, maybe that's it. Or maybe it's because another AI is about to tell the mother AI that the protagonist AI has the dog. That's also possible. Maybe um, the mother AI knows they have the dogs, and maybe the mother AI is just been ignoring it because it's not important. But now the protagonist AI is going to go against the mother AI. So the mother AI is going to now try to hurt the dog. So let's find a good why now. Why at this moment? Why at this one particular moment we have to do this? Why is this urgent? That's the big question. Personally, I kind of like the one of the mother AI is about to enact a annihilate all orc orc woof woof 
but um, I want to see if Chad has any other ideas. I'm getting low on water. I am sucking it down tonight. Oh, heaven. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put down that one, but uh, someone else has a better idea. I'll go ahead and I got a backspace button. Mother AI is about to enact a filler program against pet species. And all right. Now we are moving on. We're going to go with the stakes characters. All right. So this is, again, we're going to go, for instance, here. So we don't have to sit here now. We would do this for every single type of character. We don't. Mother A finds out the protagonist had done something not supposed to do and tries to quick anomaly remove the pet. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Okay. I'll add that in. Finds out about the protag AI going against her it her and is about to enact there we go so it's retaliation and that's fine because retaliation is something an antagonist or a villain would do so we are good stakes characters so we can continue on pets or if we want to we can shift this over to something else and I think I'd like to I don't want to keep going on what we have. We now know what the stakes are with that. That would be just kind of at that point me writing what we already have. But as you see, because we did the Mamet Corollary and we did these different goals, now if we do the stake characters as the pets, that will instantly tell us what direction um, things are going in with them. We don't need to do that. We already know where that's going to go. So let's workshop something else. So here is the stakes character. The character will be a friendly AI of the protagonist AI that let's see. We don't really know what the AI does, so we'll say this protagonist AI. I'm getting a Tron vibe. Um, uh, regulates humanities um, hmm, we'll say regulate humanities, uh, medical state, there we go, whatever, the med bot, med AI, alright, we just made up a character, okay, now with this particular parameter in mind, get a list here, what is the stake with this character. So now we're going to be spitballing. I know I kind of threw you guys into something new, but I want to go with something new. So what is the connection? What does the protagonist AI connect to with the med AI? Maybe the protagonist AI is the life support AI and the med AI is underneath them, a direct um, subordinate that requires the um, protag AI to function properly. So maybe if the protag AI breaks down as the life support monitor or whatever, then the med AI can't even do its job. So that would make the med AI, which is our stakes character, reliant upon the correct and in-system functionality of the protagonist AI in order to even do its job, let alone exist. That's a possibility. Another possibility would be that the Met AI, maybe it works in parallel to the protagonist AI. And maybe the protagonist AI and the Met AI support each other and work with each other so that the Met AI can't do its job until the protag AI does something. So in this case, if the protagonist doesn't do sequence A, the Met AI can't do sequence B. So they kind of rely and stack upon each other. Um... Maybe they're buddies and they go out to the uh, AI bar drinking AI beer every now and then. You know, kind of polling chat to see if y'all have something you really like or if you want to toss out your own eye. And while you all write up on that, I'm going to get another drink.
the only benefit to being the person in the house who did not have the dental surgery is I get all the soft drinks. All the soft drinks are belonging to steel. <laughs> Keeps the throat wet. Here's your uh, soda AMSR, AMSR for the night. Delicious. Hmm. Okay. All right. So I know that human mentioned there was a delay. And I apologize if that delay is negatively affecting you all responding. But I am going to say at this point that the steak... I like the stake of the two of them working in tandem and being a parallel because that doesn't create um, an instant power or one over the other. They're parallel processes and that requires the two of them to work together and if the protagonist disrupts that system, his actions don't just affect own. So. Um, med AI is a parallel process that needs the protagonist AI to do their job correctly and on time in order to properly function. <coughs> Oh, whoop. There we go. All right. How would the protagonist's success or failure affect that character? We now have our answer. Okay. How does success or failure affect? If the protagonist AI doesn't do its job correctly, and on time, as previously mentioned, then the med AI can't do their job and diagnose and treat humanity. Now, what happens positive. I'll write this down. So now, what happens... <clears throat> One more time. What happens to the protagonist if something positive happens to the medical AI? So let's say that medical AI gets some level of autonomy. That's a positive moment. Let's say that the uh, medical AI is able to uh, um, find a... Uh, that, that humanity is is doing here we go maybe it's the medical AI that determines that the um, humanity is in danger of dying out maybe that's where that whole piece of knowledge comes from or maybe the medical AI has a solution here we go the medical AI holds a solution to keeping humanity from being wiped out so what happens if something positive happens to this medical AI the protag AI is able to concoct on ha uh, ha uh, God I can't spell tonight concoct a plan that's not how you spell it to save humanity humanity all right now what happens negative so now what happens if the medical AI has the information in hand that the protagonist is able to use to save humanity from its doom. Maybe the medical AI is deleted by the mother AI. That information is then locked into some memory bank. And now the protagonist AI has to go and find the solution somewhere. So, the protag... AI's journey to saving humanity becomes much more complex and difficult. So the reason that I wrote it like this, the reason that I wrote it saying that if 
something happens negative to the medical AI, it doesn't just shut them down. And this is something where developers and writers, you know, take note on this, okay? You don't have to have every single one of these decision trees end in a stopgap, it all ends, everything great. You can have a failure, you can have a negative moment result in a different story branch that either you want your players or your readers to experience. Um, a good case in point, the conclusion of Dragon Age Origins when you're fighting against the Horde in Denerim. There are a number of decisions you can make as your Grey Warden character that basically removes the ability to safely kill the Archdemon from the equation. If those are removed, the only option is that you or Alistair or Loghain, one of the Wardens, perishes by sacrificing themselves when the Archdemon is killed. It's not always, okay, you fail and the Archdemon kills the world. It's not always, oh, you fail and your character is absolutely 100% going to die. Yeah, you can box yourself into a corner to where your character is the only one that dies, but it doesn't have to be that. So as you're developing these states with characters, keep in mind that you don't always have to ramp up the stake to the highest level where it's life or death across the board no matter what. Now we are going to move over into thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And we are going to at this point list how this will all kind of come to a head. So we're going to of course choose the Protag AI versus the mother AI. Now, again, for those of you who are watching, this doesn't have to end in a fight. Obviously, if this is a video game, you'd want to have some sort of final challenge. Maybe you're out thinking or dodging or uh, going around and trying to circumvent the mother AI. If it's a book, maybe they're involved in some kind of a logic you know, battle, you know. Um, uh, maybe there's other ways to resolve this conflict other than hitting it with a stick until it goes away. But having said that, we now need to titrate this whole thing down into thesis and antithesis and a synthesis. So let's create our thesis. This is what the character is attempting to do. And I'm going to go ahead and write here, but please feel free if you want to toss out anything, chat. Absolutely, I'm paying attention. Ooh, excuse me. The Protag AI wants to change its code on a fundamental level, turning itself into... A virus, you can tell I really like this concept. A virus of sorts, but will allow it to save humanity. There's your thesis. This is when you get down to it, that final confrontation of sorts is the thesis is the protagonist AI wants to change its fundamental self in order to save humanity. And of course, we all know this is going in the direction of self-sacrifice, because what we talked about earlier, but you as the writer, the game developer, would fit it to fit the story you're trying to tell. And we have the end. Antithesis. The mother AI wants to hell suffice the protagonist AI so that it will always obey the law. So I'm just putting that down. So it's not so much that the mother AI wants to destroy the protagonist AI. The mother AI wants to put everything as a status quo. Remember, if you all remember the workshop about a month ago on story outlining, 
we talked about stat old status quo and new status quo. This gets at the heart of it with this thesis and antithesis. The protagonist AI, in order to accomplish its goal of saving humanity, wants to break the old status quo forever. The mother AI, which is a stagnant and calcified force, the essence of calcification, wants to keep the old status quo forever, even if that is what annihilates humanity. And now we have the synthesis. So, these two goals, thesis and antithesis, are utterly incompatible and can never meet in the middle. The synthesis is now, how can this conflict be resolved? Now, this is where you as the game designer, or you as the writer, would really look into where you want your story to go. There are several ways this could be resolved depending upon the type of story. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and speak a few of them, but this gets down to the core of the, of the game or the book you're trying to tell. Okay? So you have your synthesis. And your synthesis could be, does the protagonist AI destroy the mother AI? Or does the mother AI win? Kind of. Uh, you know, oh, okay, hold on, let me back off a second because human asked a very good question. Does the thesis have to be fulfilled or can it be totally counteracted through the story? Okay, the thesis is the core of what the protagonist needs to accomplish. So, in order for the protagonist to succeed in totality, actually I shouldn't say totality, in general, a general success, the thesis has to be fulfilled. That doesn't mean that you as the writer or you as the game developer have to have the thesis be fulfilled. The thesis can change as well, like the goals can change. Um, a really good example is the thesis of Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker's thesis at first is to destroy Darth Vader because he is the Emperor's big bad guy. That's his thesis. While... Darth Vader's antithesis, the antithesis is Darth Vader has to destroy Luke Skywalker. Those theses and antitheses never get fulfilled because they change as the story changes. And Luke's thesis is now, I must redeem my father, Anakin. I must turn Darth Vader into Anakin Skywalker. While the antithesis, which is the opposite, is I must bring my son Luke to the dark side with me and the Emperor. So, there's never a point where it's stuck in one place. But for the protagonist to complete their final goal, their, their, their ultimate goal, thesis has to be fulfilled. If the antagonist fulfills the antithesis, then the protagonist loses. And, and keep in mind, you can have a story where the story gets told and has a satisfying conclusion but the thesis fails and the antithesis is fulfilled during synthesis. You don't have to have the good guy win. Some of the best stories in the world don't have good. Okay. Um, so for this synthesis, to conclude this story, there are multiple directions. And here's what kind of my brain has thought of while we were talking. The mother AI can't be defeated. If the mother AI is destroyed, then the whole system is going to collapse and people are going to die anyway. Mother AI is not trying to destroy the protagonist AI. The protagonist AI is just trying to change itself so that it can save humanity. So in this instance, it's not about defeating or blowing up or destroying the final boss, the mother AI. It's about changing their code. So, the synthesis is either the protagonist AI changes their code or the mother AI reverts the protagonist AI back to where it started without the chance of ever changing again. So now your story here 
is about a protagonist AI that realizes that the only way it can change it, that the only way it can save humanity is to turn itself into a virus, do whatever it does that saves humanity, and then we'll get destroyed by the system. So, I'd like to think that's a pretty compelling story. Um, hey, Bubba Hotep, welcome to the stream. We're getting near the end, but good. All right, so, obviously, there's tons of questions this opens up because, you know, literally, we just created something from scratch. But do you all see how this works, where you would take this character, whatever character you're trying to do, you would take this setup, you would take, okay, let me start over. Do you all see where you would take this um, outline, this way of doing things, and apply it to your own characters? Do you feel that this was helpful in teaching you how to make your characters relatable, making your characters sympathetic, making your characters compelling? Wrong. And while you all fight up any thoughts or any questions, I'm going to drink this Coke or Dr. Pepper or whatever it is. <clears throat> Thank you for the slime of culture, Bubba Hotep. Ooh. What if the AI reverts the protagonist AI to its start? The AI's virus somehow changes humanity instead. That's exactly. Human, that's also a possibility. Yes, that could be a synthesis. That could be a synthesis as well. Yes, that is a synthesis. As long as as long that would change the thesis and the antithesis, but that is a synthesis. The synthesis has to work with the thesis and the antithesis. So in your instance, the AI reverts the programming back, back to its start, and the virus... So in this one, the thesis would be the protagonist AI um, creates a virus or a copy of itself that acts as a virus that does something it can't do. Then it sacrifices itself and gets reverted. So that's your thesis. Your antithesis would be the mother AI stopping the protagonist AI from doing that virus bit. And then the synthesis would be what you said. So your synthesis, your thesis, and your antithesis kind of all dance around each other. And the synthesis is how the, the thesis and antithesis can be resolved. Hopefully that answered your question, human. <laughs> Reverie says, I can also see the AI turning into a virus and attacking the mother AI, effectively turning it into a new other. Yes, absolutely. That is another thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So in that one, Reverie, the thesis would be the protagonist AI wants to turn itself into a um, virus that attacks and changes the mother AI. The mother AI's antithesis would be stopping the protagonist AI from accomplishing that goal and keeping the status quo, and then the synthesis is either one or the other happen. Um, when you're creating this, the this is why I have this last. This is why this was the last thing I covered. Is everything else you do leads up to thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. They all um, lead into each other. Um, Sorry, got distracted for a second. Teal's actually making dinner downstairs. Um, she's cooking me dinner. I just realized she's making me something. Oh my god, my wife is making me food. I love her. Okay, so the three points, the central questions, the goal, all of this lead to this. This is the end result, is your thesis, your antithesis, and your synthesis. Human says, you need to go back to school, really. You need to go back to school. Can you give an example of fair storytelling here? Or the writer might fail. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so, human's asking, can I give an example of where the writer failed to synthesize? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I'd have to choose something that was really written poorly or didn't have a good and satisfying uh, way of doing it. <sighs> Actually, I would, but every time I say something like that, I get a look, Booba Hotep. So, um,. All right, here we go. An example of a failure in storytelling where a writer failed to synthesize.
It's really hard to pick out an example where a synthesis didn't happen properly, but it's easy to pick out a synthesis that doesn't work, that, that doesn't add any value. Because when you get down to it, your conflict of a story is between two opposing forces, and those opposing forces... Hmm... You got me there, human. I don't know if I can think of one where it just failed. But I can think of one where it... Well, the thing is this, okay? Like in the story itself, a bad synthesis in the AI story. Right, okay. Okay, so... Yes, here we go. Let's go ahead and look at what we have on screen. Thank you for, for that, human. Okay. So, thesis. The protag AI wants to change its code. Antithesis. The mother AI wants to calcify. A bad synthesis would be something along the lines of an outside force coming in and saving the day. Um, humanity suddenly wakes up and deletes the mother AI with the delete button. That would be a bad synthesis. Um, another bad synthesis would be um, the... Yeah, another that would be a really bad, it would be a terrible synthesis. Uh, not just do ex machina, but that would just be crappy. Another bad synthesis between these two um, in this particular story. Yeah, do ex machina. Well, do ex machinas can work, but not in this particular instance. Um, it would be bad. Another bad one would be the mother AI is about to catch or capture the protagonist AI, and suddenly the mother AI has a complete change of heart. That would be a bad synthesis. The mother AI has no reason to have a a, uh, a change of heart. Nothing has ever been laid out throughout the entire course of the narrative. And suddenly the mother AI, oh, I've been so bad. Humanity needs to survive. I was terrible. Yeah. So, yeah, don't do something like that. I know. Works where a duex machina can work. Uh, duex machina worked really great. Negro Allen posed the pit and the pendulum. Um, the protagonist goes through utter hell in that story and ends up getting rescued because uh, invading forces on the outside uh, or invading the Spanish Inquisition um, and defeat Torquemada. That's actually okay. In that particular instance, it's not a do ex machina out of laziness. Edgar Allan Poe is acknowledging that there was something happening in the background while the protagonist was going through this hellish torture and it just so happened at the end he was saved. So, do ex machina, if done right, is absolutely fine. Reverie says, would you say a bad synthesis is one where a third factor suddenly appeared that magically resolves a crisis? Yes, that's what I was talking about earlier, with uh, the human suddenly rising up against the machine. It just, it's out of nowhere. It's, if there was no tells, if there was nothing setting it up, nothing at all, and it comes out of nowhere, yes, absolutely, that's, that's a bad synthesis. You, you don't want to do that. Um, you want the feel, you want the reader or the player to feel like what was in front of them, even if they weren't expecting it, even if it was something out of left field, but the clues were there that that resolved the conflict. That's fine. Um, gosh, you can do tons of those. There are tons of examples. Of course, now that I'm on the spot, I can't think of them. Um, I were on the tip of my tongue and I missed it. Um, but yes, if, if if you lay out the tells throughout the course of your narrative that a third factor is going to appear and that third factor shows up at the end and, and is the resolution, is the synthesis, then you're fine. It's okay. As long as it resolves it. If that thesis versus... If that thesis versus antithesis um, is not resolved then the main conflict is not resolved. So you have to synthesize, even if it's a third factor that you create and have been leading into and alluding to over the course of your whole story. So don't drop it. Have that synthesis occur. Is Ray's lightsaber, saber lighting, lightning? I don't know what that means. Sorry, Reverie. I'm afraid I do not know what you're talking about. I require clarification, please. I need to put a big emblem out there and tell my wife she's recovering from dental surgery. So, I don't know if y'all heard this, but he'll just shouted something from downstairs. Uh, 
And what she said is, a bad synthesis is this. Um, at the end of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, specifically I think she's talking about the movie, they have a very good battle scene between Peter and the White Queen. And it's a really good fight. And Aslan, as in the prophecy, comes in and kills her. That's not a very good synthesis. It's actually handled better, I think, in the book than it is in the uh, in the movie. It's a duex machina in the book, but it's a duex machina that they really lead up to. They give you that feeling that it has to be this way, that only Aslan can kill Goddess. But in the movie, in order to kind of pad things out, they actually built a fantastic fight scene between the uh, uh, the White Queen and Peter, and it was handled really well. Very well choreographed. I gotta give, uh, I think it's Kate Blanchett uh, credit. She, she she swings Florentine swords like a damn pro. But when Aslan shows up, it's not a very good synthesis because they built up Peter versus the White Witch. Um, now, oh, okay, so Reverie, if you're talking about The Rise of Skywalker, I've never seen it. I honestly, um, I'm not gonna sit here and, and make it into a, a big deal, but I could not get into that trilogy very well. Um, especially after the first one and then the second one. I just, I didn't really, I couldn't get into it. So yeah, I know about it, but I've never watched it. So if you're, if there's a bad synthesis in the ninth Star Wars film, I wouldn't be surprised, but that's because they had a lot going against them. Um, so there it is. Anyway, uh, let me see. We're getting near the end. So if anyone has any other questions or comments and is not recovering from dental surgery, please toss them out. Just heard my wife laugh downstairs. <laughs> we're, we're, all right. Well, it may be the case. I'm not going to turn this into a, uh, a, a ne and talking negative about something that um, if, if, it, if it has a bad if the thesis, which is Ray defeating Palpatine, and the antithesis, which is Palpatine defeating Rey, is handled in a way that neither one actually resolves the conflict, or something that is out of left field that has been given no illusion during the course of movie 7, 8, and 9 occurs that allows Rey to defeat Palpatine, then yes, that's a bad synthesis. If regardless of how much you don't like the film, if it's handled in a way where you have built up to the point where Rey can defeat Palpatine, then it's a good synthesis. Yeah, she, she, guys, she does not want to be away. My wife Teal wants to be a part of Studio Blue. My wife Teal also wants to understand that this, that was a major ass surgery, and she needs to not do that. I'm fussing because I love that woman. I love her very, very much. But it's obvious. I mean, she she sat out and she tossed out that whole line in the witch in the wardrobe bit. She wants to be a part of things. I feel bad. Just gotta wait a little longer. Okay, so we are nearing the end of the stream. I'm gonna give uh, about I'm gonna have about ten, maybe fifteen minutes tops for last minute questions. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just kind of relax, chat with you guys. If you have any last minute questions about the topic at hand, please throw them out. Also, I would like to solicit solicit anyone who is watching for feedback who hasn't already given some. Was this a good stream? Do you want to see more of this? So, like with world building, we're going to do more world building. Do you want to see more character building um, workshops like this one that will build off the foundation of this one? What should come first, character or story outline? That depends on you, Reverie. That depends on the writer. That depends on the game designer. You don't have to do one before the other. Uh, some people write very character-driven stories, and they can't do the first part of their plot until they have all their characters designed. Some can't do a single thing until their whole world is designed. Some can't do a thing with characters or things with the world until they have their basic story outlined. you got to find what works best for you. Bubba Hotep says, Steel, I did something Teal would love yesterday. You toasted some marshmallows on a fire. I'll be sure to tell that Bubba Hotep will like that. Reverie says, like, we just created a character out of thin air, and the story basically wrote itself. Right, exactly. Well, Reverie, that's also the magic of when you've been doing this for a while, you kind of start having that happen. But it's also that was crowds. We kind of did it as a group. Group brainstorming is one of the most powerful things in the world. 
Um, that is why almost all AAA games are designed by committee. People have this weird thing in their head that AAA games have a lead designer like Todd Howard for Bethesda, and he sits there and he pulls up the story for the next Elder Scrolls game out of the ether and people obey. That's very rarely the case. In fact, there's only one game designer I am aware of who creates everything and then people just implement that person's vision. And that's David Cage of Contractic Dreams, the guy who did Detroit Become Human. Um, he is the main creative and everyone else pretty much implements his vision. That is highly rare. Most game development companies, I know the ones that I work for did, um, everything is done by committee. Yeah, a couple of people come up with the base ideas. Sometimes you have a writer who does the main story writing, but then everyone kind of contributes and puts the ideas together. Because when everyone works together, you can get magic, and it happens a lot fast. Uh, no, even Kojima does not do what David Cage does. Kojima comes up with the basic story, and then the team kind of implements how it will happen. And Kojima will create the story threads, and people will implement it. David Cage creates everything from start to finish, and people are just implementing it. That's why he's only released like three or four games over the course of 20 years, or however long the PS2 has been out, because that's when Fahrenheit came out, um, while Kojima's released more. Now, Kojima is very tightly structured on his stuff. Uh, Nomura, the guy who does Kingdom Hearts, very tightly structured. But they still write by committee. Um, Human says, is this character creation process something that most writers just do or many just wing it? Human, this is what your really successful writers do. Um, I am giving you all the tips that I learned over the course of my writing career, building me up from beginning to publication. That doesn't mean they follow this exact outline. Everything that I just showed you is what Steele has learned over his many years of writing, both fiction and game. Um, there are people who run courses like this, and you could take courses. There are workshops. I've been to workshops of many different writers, Chris Metternich, Gage Johnson, um, who that's all they do nowadays. They just teach how to write. So is this one thing right here that you learn today? Everything that everyone does knows what Steele does. Um, do most writers just wing it? Yes. Do most successful writers wing it? No. Uh, tightly structured in the sense, not tightly structured, Ron, tightly structured in the sense of the narrative of the individual story, not in the meta story. The meta story of Kingdom Hearts is a damn mess. <laughs> it is a mess. And we've gone over why in many of our AMAs. It's not because Nomura is a bad storyteller. He's a very good storyteller. It's because Nomura created a game that was not meant to have any sequels, much less all the spinoffs. When you create something that's meant to be a one-off, and then suddenly you got to do six more of them, that's a problem. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why, and I know a lot of people uh, roll their eyes when you bring up Harry Potter, that's the reason why the seven Harry Potter books are so good, is Rowling had a plan. I don't know if she always knew she wanted to do seven books, but she had a plan and she knew exactly what her plan was and exactly where she wanted to go with it. That's why she was able to create a very successful, best-selling, phenomenal series that won her all the money forever, while other people who create things, you know, they kind of either fall flat or they don't go anywhere. Um, there's also a danger of what happens when the person who is writing the story either passes away, unfortunately, or uh, doesn't provide either good documentation or have good creative control. Um, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time is a fantastic series. It's also very long. It has a lot of books. A lot of books. And a lot of books. Robert Jordan was very good friends with Brand Br Brandon Sanderson, and he left copious amounts of notes for his the ending of his Wheel of Time series. When Robert Jordan sadly passed away, his good friend Brandon Sanderson was able to take those notes, was familiar enough with Jordan's style of writing, and he was able to finish the Wheel of Time series. George R. R. Martin, who has written the fantastic A Song of Ice and Fire series, did not provide as much creative control, and I don't know if it was for anything on his end or on HBO's end, I'm not going to speculate. But the Game of Thrones TV series had problems at the end because when they surpassed George R. R. Martin's books, 
he didn't actually do anything as the creative to really push forward that ending of his, ser of his show, and the TV series, unfortunately, had the problems it had. Um, he does not wing it. No. No. Sanderson is very well structured. Um, he knows exactly what he's going to get into uh, um, literally from the very beginning. Um, the few times I've, I've actually, and I, I've, I've spoken to him, the few times I've actually spoken to him, not like buddy, 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 but a few times I have spoken to him, he always goes in with a plan. He always goes in with a plan. Is it like every last sentence is structured? No. But he does not write off the seat of his pants. He is not what you would be considered a pantser by any stretch of the imagination. Neither, neither is Neil Gaiman, neither is Stephen Bruce, neither is um, Jim Butcher. Yes, to some extent, every writer and every game developer is going to at some point go, you know what, insert cool thing here, and then later on puts in the cool thing, whether it be an awesome scene or in a video game or an awesome sequence in a book. They're going to at some point do that. Because if you plan everything super tightly um, and don't allow some creative freedom to come out, it's going to show the work is going to look stifled and stagnated. Um, if you allow for some level of creative winging it, some creative leeway, then you do. But you don't wing it from start to finish and come out with a fantastic product. Um, I, I've never seen anything that has been of any length that has been completely winged and come out quality. But at the same token, I've never seen anything that's been super tightly structured from start to finish and has come out and been all so you know i mean even david cage's stories at some point his vision has to be executed by someone other than himself now i do want to say something um on that before we kind of go off on a slight tangent before i, I kind of ended up this changes a little bit if you're indie dev so for those of you out there who are creating your own game you have to do everything yourself so if you tightly structure it enough that you feel comfortable, or if you wing it just enough that you feel comfortable, then that's fine. Don't feel that you have to follow all of these precepts that I just laid out today. I'm only teaching you the fundamentals. It's up to you to take these fundamentals and structure it in a way that helps you. So if you're not comfortable with creating thesis, antithesis, and synthesis as a line, as a, as a grouping every single time, if you're not comfortable writing this down, all the time if you don't want to go through every single part of your story and put them a met corollary that's fine you don't have to at a certain point you can go insert cool thing here what you don't want to do is have your entire work be that so for you indie devs out there who are listening to this it's okay sometimes take a step back put your organizational tools to the side and just let the characters and story speak through you same thing with you indie writers Sometimes you got to step back, put your outline to the side, close that book, put your hands on the keyboard, and just start writing. You can always fix it in revision. So many people are terrified of revision. Don't be. You will fix it later. Sometimes just let those characters speak through you. I'm going to open it up to one last more question before we call it for the evening. Uh, for those people who are still hanging around, thank you so much for being here the entire time. Um, I, uh, I'm very grateful to have you all. I'm very grateful. I want to thank again, um, pardon me, Drifty T and everyone who showed up and dropped the donos. I want to thank Miyaka for once again being the Miyaka Christmas special with the sub. So love you very much, stream mom. Um, you guys have been amazing. So I'm going to open it up. If I don't see one more question in the next minute or two, I'm going to hit that credits button because I have food and I need to eat. I'm a hungry steel. <sighs> and I hope y'all have had a good time. I really do. I love doing these things. All right. I think it's time. <clears throat> Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Phil and I started this journey, and we're going to continue it every step of the way, and it's because of you all, the fans friends, and family of Studio Blue that we're able to get through this. We love you guys very deeply. I want you to know that. We think about you all every day. And we're going to be here for many years to come because we're all family together. 
I look forward to seeing you this Wednesday when I will do a critical play of Edge of Eternity. If you like what you saw, leave the SmackDown like button below, subscribe to our channel, consider supporting us on Patreon, and connect with us on our Facebook, Discord, Twitter, and we'll see you in the next video. Love you guys. Someone new